All right. I'm going to give out a quick report out from closed session. So before we start, the City Council just met on three closed session items, and there's nothing to report out at this time. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for a committee interview being held just before our council meeting this evening. We will be interviewing one candidate for one vacancy with a term expiring March 31st, 2025, on the Wetlands and Creeks Committee. Do we have any public comment for this special meeting before we hold this interview? All right. Well, welcome, Nathaniel Pope. Um, we are going to go through and ask you some questions. Um, try to keep your answer at about a minute. Um, if you need us to repeat anything or if you have anything additional, great. I'm going to start with Council Member Schaefer. All right. Welcome. Good to have you here. Um, my first question is just why are you interested in serving on the Wetlands and Creeks Committee and what skill set can you bring to this committee? Hello, everybody. Uh, I am interested because I, uh, I I walk my dog very frequently or in and around town at the marsh and uh, uh, Jane's Creek side of the community forest frequently. And I just have been here for a long time and feel a sort of civic duty to try to at least give my expertise to the city to help manage the uh, forests and wetlands and creeks he here. Um, and my expertise being, I am a registered professional forester. I passed last July the exam. Um, and uh, basically, it's, I uh, have a breadth of knowledge in forestry, uh, forest ecosystems, and uh, well, as we know where our water originates, it's in the woods, so. Uh, yeah. Thank you, welcome. So what, um, what do you see as upcoming opportunities and challenges for the city's wetland, creek, and riparian areas? Uh, Probably the biggest challenge that I see is the city trying to accommodate the growth of Cal Poly through its expansion with several uh, housing developments in the area, whether it's attached to the university or not. Uh, as we know, like building construction uh, has big impacts on water quality and runoff. So that's that would be where I'd see the biggest opportunity to do something, I guess. Great, thank you. Um, describe your knowledge, experience, and or connection to Arcata's wetlands, creeks, or sensitive habitat areas. Um, as a uh, individual, I have a, my, my hobbies include uh, fly fishing and duck hunting, and so through those hobbies, I've picked up several, um, I've just learned a lot about the ecosystem in and around Arcata and the watersheds and creeks in the North Coast region, how they operate, and then it, through work as well, uh, working in different areas uh, in and around Humboldt County that have very similar watersheds to what we have in Arcata has, uh, yeah, just given me that knowledge of, so. Wonderful, thank you. So Nathaniel, um, my question to you is, restoration and monitoring are important to inform our science-based decision-making and future management. And please describe your experience or expertise with natural resource restoration or monitoring that could be an asset to the city. So thank you. Uh, as far as <coughs> restoration efforts that I've done is uh, I have experience doing manual labor uh, as, as well as permitting um, a uh, oak woodland management uh, silviculture within a timber harvest plan, um, that being uh, the restoration of a uh, oak woodland on the company property that I work for. Um, so <laughs> I 
in some ways yeah. you sort of answered that question before, but thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, could you share an example of successful collaboration that you've been a part of in the realm of restoration, open space, or community building, and then what made that collaboration successful? Uh, as an RPF for a timber company, I have proposed harvest units adjacent to other landowners that are not industrial um, industrial timber companies. And as part of those projects, I've reached out to these neighbors and come to agreements with um, what exactly uh, they want done in, in conjunction with what the company sees fit to protect their resources, aesthetic, visual, uh, and timber resources on their properties through you know, just reaching out, meeting with them, and coming to an agreement, whether that's a compromise or uh, both parties get exactly what they want out of it. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Does anybody have any other questions for Mr. Pope? Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, we will be making our decision during new business. You're welcome to stick around and watch the meeting or... Um, so, so I just want to, you know, the Wetlands Committee meets the third um, Tuesday of the month and that works well for you? Yes, and that's at uh, 6 p.m. Uh, and it's six times a year, so it's not burdensome. That okay. works just fine for me. Thank you. I have a really quick question. Where's your favorite place or places for fly fishing? I would probably say the Trinity River, uh, any section of it. Big fan of fishing there. Thank you. All right, well, wonderful. Thank you so very much. All right, and this is kind. This will conclude our Wetlands and Creeks Committee interview, and it looks like we will come back for our regular meeting at six o'clock.
All right, six o'clock. Let's get started. Let's get started. Good evening. Good evening, and thank you for viewing the April 3rd meeting of the Arcata City Council. The City Council meeting is being held as a hybrid meeting with both in-person attendance and teleconference access via Zoom. We'll start with a land acknowledgement. The City of Arcata acknowledges that the lands we are located on are the unceded ancestral lands of the Wiat tribe. The land that Arcata rests on is known in the Wiat language as Guniri, meaning over in the woods or among the redwoods. Past actions by local, state, and federal governments removed the Wiat and other indigenous peoples from the land and threatened to destroy their cultural practices. The city of Arcata acknowledges the Wiat community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. This acknowledgement seeks to aid in dismantling the legacy and narratives of settler colonialism. If you would like to please join me for the flag salute. Will the city clerk please call roll? Mayor Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Stillman? Present. Council Member Schaefer? Here. Council Member Atkins Salazar? Here. Council Member White? Here. All present. Thank you. If you wish to make a comment during the meeting, either at the two open public comment periods or for an individual agenda item, there are three ways to do so. If you are here in person, please line up behind the podium when the item you would like to speak on is accepting public comment. If you are logged into Zoom, click raise your hand when it is time for public comment on the item you wish to speak on. And if you are on the phone, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your turn, you'll be prompted to dial star six on your phone. For each item, we will be taking in-person public comment first and then move to online comments. We will not be going back and forth. So if you're wanting to comment, please line up at the podium or raise your electronic hand as soon as public comment is requested for that item. Um, we'll now have ceremonial matters. Um, the first ceremonial matter is a proclamation in recognition of the 2024 Godwit Days Spring Migration Bird Festival from April 18th to 21st, 2024, and that will be read by Councilwoman Schaefer. In recognition of the 2024 Godwit Days, whereas about 85 million Americans enjoy observing, photographing, or feeding wild birds, and a 2011 U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service study found that bird watchers contributed about 32 billion to the U.S. economy, and whereas birding is the 15th most popular outdoor activity, just below bicycling, about 18 million birders take trips exclusively to commune with other birders or count birds by sight or sound. And whereas the Godwit Days Spring Migration Bird Festival showcases the area's rich diversity of birds, normally attracting tourists from all over the United States and makes Humboldt County a birding destination. And whereas Godwit Days has attracted over 350 registered participants in past years, with over 50% of whom came from out of the area. And whereas ecotourism continues to be an important contributing segment of the North Coast economy, Humboldt Bay, its river estuaries, the region's mountains, coniferous forests, and rugged ocean coasts habitat rugged ocean coast habitat offers a variety of bird species for viewing that surpasses the total bird species counts of 40 different states and 10 canadian provinces now therefore be it proclaimed that the city council of the city of arcata hereby recognizes the humboldt county businesses and residents who are participating in the 2024 godwit days spring migration bird festival as well as future birding visitors to the Pacific North Coast. May they be inspired to migrate back just as the birds have been doing for centuries. Dated today, April 3rd, signed by our mayor, Meredith Matthews. And then we have the chair of the Godwit Days Board of Directors here to accept it, who happens to be Vice Mayor Stillman. I'd like to thank the city of Arcata for this proclamation and once again we're meeting on a weekly basis because we're getting so close to it and our mayor will also be giving an opening address on Friday night for a few minutes as we open with the zoo so this year we thought the zoo is doing so many things around uh, restoration of birds 
that it would be interesting to find out what they've been doing. And so that's our program on uh, Friday night. And then on Saturday, we'll have our plenary speaker. Gaba Days was started by the city of Arcata with their Economic Development Committee began that probably 27 years ago. And in the beginning, it was assigned to the assistant city manager. None of them were really excited about running events. But later, um, Arcata Main Street took it over and then it became a nonprofit. And so we operate as a nonprofit. And uh, we have, I think, about 257 people already registered for it. And we're ahead of the game normally, and we already know who's going to be doing things next year. So I'd like to thank you very much for this proclamation. Thank you so much. And the next proclamation is in recognition of the Week of the Young Child, April 6th, 12th, 2024. And this proclamation will be read by Councilman White. Yeah, so in recognition of the Week of the Young Child, April 6th through the 12th, 2024, whereas North Coast Children's Services and other local organizations in conjunction with the National Association of Education of Young Children are celebrating the Week of Young Children from April 6th to, through the 12th, 2024, and whereas children's cognitive, physical, social, emotional, and language and literacy development are built on the foundation of children's positive interactions with adults, peers, and their environment. And whereas participation in high quality early childhood education saves taxpayer dollars, makes working families more economically secure, and prepares children to succeed in school, earn higher wages, and live healthier lives. And whereas high quality early childhood education depends on early childhood educators who ensure that children supported by families have the early experiences they need for a strong foundation. And whereas North Coast Children's Services founded as a parent cooperative in 1969, has served young children in our community for over 50 years, serving over 600 of our community's neediest children and families annually. And whereas North Coast Children's Services Head Start and Early Head Start and state-funded programs success in improving the early learning outcomes rest in the leadership of parents and support from local businesses, municipalities, community members, and neighbors, as well as a skilled workforce, and whereas teachers and other helpers who make a difference in the lives of young children in Arcata deserve thanks and recognition and public policies that support early learning for young children are crucial to the future of well-being of our community. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the City Council of our City of Arcata hereby recognizes the week of April 6th through the 12th, 2024, as the week of the young child and encourages our community to make an investment in early childhood education because early years are learning years. Dated April 3rd, 2024, by Mayor Matthews, Meredith Matthews, and the uh, gentleman is going to be our executive director, North Coast Children's Services, Rodney Owen. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Um, not only do our programs um, support just children, we support families too, and that, you know, through social service supports and also allowing parents to the opportunity to work when we're providing child care. Um, but we also bring into the community a lot of economic benefits. Last year, we brought in over $14 million to the community, and a lot of that goes through wages and into the local economy. Um, and I think everybody knows the importance of these early years in children's lives. And so thank you for this proclamation and recognition for the work that our staff does. Um, it's appreciated. And our last proclamation of the day is in recognition of Sexual Assault Awareness Month, April 2024. And Councilwoman Atkin Salazar will be reading that. Thank you. Whereas sexualized violence affects children, youth, adults, and elders of all genders from all racial, cultural, and economic backgrounds with public health and social justice implications for every person in Arcata. And whereas staff and volunteers of the North Coast Rape Crisis Team provide 24-hour service to, 
um, to survivors and their significant others and encourages every person to end sexualized violence by providing prevention education and awareness raising programs throughout Humboldt and Del, no Del Norte counties. And whereas no one person, organization, agency, or community can eliminate sexual assault on their own, but can, through collaboration and partnership, work together to support those impacted, improve responses, and ensure that survivors are not re-victimized. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the City Council of the City of Arcata reaffirms its commitment to the North Coast Rape Crisis Team and its vision, HEAL, help, empower, affirm, listen, and acknowledges April 2024 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month. It's dated today and signed by our Mayor Matthews. And we have today the Education and Outreach Manager, um, Kira Morse, here to get that. Thank you to the Arcata City Council for your continued support of, the sex, of Sexual Assault Awareness Month and the North Coast Rape Crisis Team. Uh, our team continues to provide free and confidential services 24 hours a day, seven days a week to anyone of any age or gender who has experienced or been affected by sexualized violence. In the past year, our team has served over 470 survivors in Humboldt County alone and their families through advocacy, accompaniment, crisis intervention, and counseling. Our services are rooted in our values to heal. Um, we aim to help survivors by meeting them where they are emotionally as well as geographically. Um, we aim to empower survivors um, and for them to empower themselves through their healing journey, uh, to affirm their choices and listen to their stories. Our work is not possible without uh, partner agencies, most notably law enforcement, the district attorney's office, uh, sexual assault nurse examiners, and tribal organizations. Our team has been actively seeking donations to continue our efforts in supporting survivors through numerous fundraisers. Uh, to keep up to, up to date on where our team is gonna be in April, Sexual Assault Awareness Month, please check out our social media accounts as well as our website. We can be found on Instagram at NCRCT Humboldt and Facebook as the North Coast Rape Crisis Team. Uh, we're also having our banner up in the Arcata Plaza. So if you guys wanted to check that out, you can post a picture, tag us, it'd be highly appreciated. Thank you again for honoring our work and the survivors that we serve. Thank you so much. Next, we have a report by committee. So our annual report for the Wetlands and Creeks Committee um, and Justin Hawkins, the vice chair of that committee is gonna give us a report. Yes, hello, my name is Justin Hawkins. I'm the vice chair of the Wetlands and Creeks Committee. Um, we're a committee, we're comprised of environmental professionals with many decades worth of restoration experience. And I'm just gonna go over a couple highlights from our annual report. Um, we were able to provide feedback on the city's general plan, particularly the resource conser conservation and management element. Uh, we also served on the ad hoc group for the open space parks and trails special tax where we are able to advocate for a new groundskeeper position at the marsh as well as the help channel fund funding towards fish surveys amongst our urban creeks particularly Jane's and um, Jolly Giant Creek uh, and that was in collaboration with Cal Poly Humboldt grad students led by local fish biologist Darren Ward and they had some pretty exciting results. We have been consistently finding coho juvenile uh, in our creeks. Uh, they're a threatened species and they're native to here. And so building off that, we've been developing a concept proposal for CDFW to help generate funding for a planning grant around Jolly Giant Creek. Um, this is sort of to help navigate development, which is much needed in the city, and see how we can better support our creek while meeting our developmental needs. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, please. I noticed one of the things you were interested in is being able to know what was going on with the other committees. I think I read that in your report. Oh, sure, yeah, absolutely. Unless I made a note. And so I was wondering, maybe, um, 
the annual reports that committees do, maybe they should be disseminated to the other committees so that everyone would have a way. I know we're gonna soon be coming along and having all the chairs together for all the committees, but would that be a helpful thing as if your committee had access to those reports when they come to us? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Um, you know, I think more documentation is helpful when people have time to get into it. Um, I will say the uh, measure, a, the ad hoc, the open space parks and trail special tax was also a great opportunity where I met parks and rec and also community force mem uh, committee members there too. And so I think having more things like that might help as well. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. It's time for early oral communication. The city values your comment. This 15 minute time period allows people to address the council on matters that are not on the agenda. Please know that pursuant to the Brown Act, the council cannot discuss or take action on items that are not listed on the posted agenda. At the end of all oral communications, the city may respond to statements. Supported requests that require council action will be set for a future agenda or referred to staff. Speakers will be limited to two minutes. There will also be time at the end for the public to comment specifically on each agenda item and again at the end of the meeting um, under item 12. Um, please make your way to the podium and raise your hand if you're on Zoom and press star nine if you're calling in by phone and wish to make comments. So if you'd like to make public comment, please line up. Good evening, Council. I'm Fred Wise. Uh, last night, the Council had their, their annual goal setting study session. It was not televised, not streamed, not recorded. The only way for the public to see it was to be there. Other study sessions have been streamed and recorded. I think that should become normal. There was an agenda item about the recent survey, had the results. Uh, they, in my opinion, that does not belong in a study session. Should have come to a regular city council meeting. Um, the results can be seen on arcata1.com. I'll be writing more articles about it. There are a lot in that survey. The, um, there are two, the survey was about increasing the possibility of increasing taxes to raise funds for Arcata. There were two items, on one on building height, one on land use, that should not have been there. The building height said, quote, increasing the allowable building height from four stories to a maximum of seven stories to increase the availability of housing affordable to working families while protecting open space. Who's going to say no to that question? No one affordable housing for working families, but it doesn't take seven story buildings to make affordable housing for working families. And there's nothing, nothing in the gateway area plan that says the purpose of those buildings is to provide affordable housing for working families. It also says that uh, parking lots, parking, whether in lots or on the street is a low priority. 85% of the people said it was a high priority or medium priority for parking on the street, 75% said that off-street parking is important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, Dave Meserve. Um, I'm sure from closed session, you found that uh, the Earth Flag case has been decided by Judge Canning. And no. <laughs> you didn't, all right. Well, it, it was decided. Um, it was decided uh, in the favor of the city. Um, and what I just want to say is that I think just the name of the case speaks for what this um, case was about, which is the city of Arcata versus citizens in support of Measure M. The citizens of Arcata voted to fly the earth flag at the top of city flagpoles and the city of Arcata chose to file a suit opposing what the people of Arcata had decided. And the judge ruled not totally unexpectedly in favor of the state laws, which were all written uh, back in the red scare into the McCarthy era which declared that no flag shall ever fly above the American flag and it will be a 
felony to fly a red flag is the one right next to the one that says that. So obviously I'm disappointed, but as this comes forward to you to consider, and it's funny that I brought it to you, uh, but um, as it comes forward to you, I would ask that as we consider whether we're going to appeal, which I think we may, and knowing how they ruled, but um, that you would leave the flag there until this case is fully resolved. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Deborah Loisel, and I'm a registered engineer, uh, civil and transportation in California, and I moved here to get a second degree in science and management, and specifically planning and policy, and I'm in, in local planning, and we're studying housing, so one of our requirements is to come here and make a comment. So I'm commenting <laughs> on housing because I pay more than my mortgage was in Sacramento for a very small apartment right next to the highway, so I was disappointed in the cost of living here. So. I'm commenting on your general plan and the zoning code. I just believe there's too much yellow, which is the residential low density um, on your zoning map with not enough tan, which is the residential high zoning. So Arcata in the general plan talks about um, promoting high density residential neighborhoods by rezoning, yet all the neighborhoods near the university are still zoned yellow. And I'm guessing that is because the property owners do not want their property value to decline, opposed to working for affordable housing for the college students that come here, including me. So the low des density residential zoning should be a thing of the past. It promotes sprawl and the increase in vehicle miles traveled. Um, for the planet, for the community, for livability, high density residential and mixed use zoning needs to be represented as the majority of the residential land uh, zoning in Arcata. So college students bring a lot to this economy and you should be making it easier for them to live, not harder. And I think the graduation rate is 49% and I'm guessing most of them leave because they need to find a more economical place to live. And Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Rhiannon Lopez, and as a student and active community member, I encourage this council and community to continue to work towards building a better relationship with Cal Poly Humble and demand transparency and accountability from the university administration. Um, to be better about protect, uh, protecting students' safety and well-being and overall success. By uh, continuing to address insecurity of housing and the university's failing of providing adequate resources for my fellow students. Far too many of us are living in our vehicles or crammed into houses just to afford the cost of living and student and school expenses. Arcata is on the right track uh, with the development of multi-use and higher density housing demonstrated in the Gateway Access Plan and the incentive and resources provided for existing home, homeowners to explore uh, the implementation of accessory dwelling units onto existing properties. These are good starting points, but we should not become complacent with minimal progress. We do not have the luxury of time. The city of Arcata and Cal Poly Humboldt have the unique and fleeting opportunity to be an innovative leader in how it addresses, excuse me, and how it addresses the housing shortage with the expected population growth and the mitigation of climate change effects while protecting our open spaces and ecological communities. I encourage the city to keep seeking input from students and other stakeholders who often leave the area due to the lack of resources, thus losing large contributors to the local economy and the potential workforce that could help address these issues. Here in Arcata, we have a unique composition of stakeholders and resources, such as the lo local university administration, programs and students, the Arcata populace, and local indigenous tribes to put perspectives together to develop sustainable and ed innovative, equitable adaptations to these projected events. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Good evening, Gregory Daggett. Um, I'm going to address the, the vote from last week from the Planning Commission. And um, 
I'll just make it clear that my position last week was the, the difference between uh, Judith and the other commissioner that was on, on, on the commission already, which basically he didn't have any background at all. And we had Judith who um, 16 years of experience and a PhD. Um, so I think it was very unfortunate the direction you went. If it was in another environment, imagine it was over at, a, at, at the university, um, you know, there would be somebody asking you some questions about that and you probably would have been reprimanded for it from the standpoint of how, how, do, you, how do you justify a person with, with zero experience and somebody with a PhD who's been working um, for free for 16 years and has basically been like the anchor there from the standpoint of we have new members that come in all the time and she's the person that sort of you know knows more even than the staff so um i don't, I don't really buy your um argument that it was just new blood you know that we needed somebody you know it, it you were getting you were getting somebody new but you chose to um you know bump her off and it just wasn't a very elegant way to do it, you know. Somebody with that that kind of experience and that, that many years, and um, you know, it made the the newspaper or the, the the standard. And you know, there's a quote from her that basically feels like you know they just you just wanted her out of the way from the standpoint she was the one that was questioning things, and everybody else was pretty much you know overriding her at the time. So I think it was very unfortunate. Thank you. We only have one person on Zoom, so I'm going to finish with these two public commenters in person. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name's Joanne McGarry, and I want to talk about three things, but um, you got my emails, and what Gregory had to say, I um, echo a large part of what he has to say about the decision made last week. I want to um, let you know that this resolution on ceasefire, I attended the Humboldt Unitarian Universalist Fellowship um, Sunday before last, and they um, had it on their agenda, this exact um, con uh, resolution, and they, in consensus, adopted the same language of this resolution, except they put the Humboldt Unitarian Universalist Fellowship instead of the city of Arcata, and added the city of Arcata and the city of Eureka and the county as being recipients of um, that resolution that the humble Unitarians passed. So I just want you to know if you hadn't heard yet that that happened. And uh, hopefully other municipalities, including Eureka, will be considering the language of this. The second thing I want to say is um, agendas and um, knowing what's happening. The screens here talk a lot about different things on the agenda, but there are these screens now at different places that you can see a printout of what's happening. And it would be really nice, I think, if we had something like that during the meeting so those people who are just attending and stuff could learn about what's happening on the agenda you know, with some sort of screen. My final thing I want to say is that what Dave Meserve had to say is the city of Arcata versus the citizens of measure whatever. This is a triangle. It's the people on the council, it's staff, and it's the people of the city of Arcata. And we are as important as anybody in this, so I want to just remind you that you are serving us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. As I understand, this is something that will be coming in front of the police chief soon, so I wanted to pipe in. Um, hello, my name is Natalie Walston. I currently own two plaza-facing businesses. I consider myself a compassionate person, and yes, yet I'm also a business owner. As a business owner, one of my primary goals is to attract and retain patrons, not just to my business, but to all businesses in Arcata. It is discouraging to day after day witness the activities that take place in the middle of the plaza, activities that undermine our ability to make our employees and patrons feel welcome and safe. The north side of the plaza has become home to an ongoing group of inhabitants who, when I arrive at 8.30 in the morning, are there, and they spend the entire day violating every single posted code with no interruption or interference. Their dogs run free on the plaza, they smoke, they drink, they yell and fight, they do drugs, they sell drugs, and they leave trash. They create an incredibly unwelcoming space for people whose sole intention is to be able to just walk down the sidewalk. 
In addition, they become a gravitational pull for people to both buy and sell drugs and join the party. We stare out at this all day, every day. Some rotating cast of characters, same daily decision on whether it's bad enough for us to call the police. We also see the sweet families visiting into town who unknowingly stroll down that side of the street only to have to walk through clouds of smoke and partying. If we, as the ones running and patronizing businesses, are chased around all day and fined for breaking parking code, why isn't the same being done for those violating codes and making the plaza feel unwelcome, unsafe, and undesirable? I understand that there are limits to what can be done, but in my 12 years of experience working on this plaza, I can tell you what I do know. This group follows the path of least resistance. They go where they know they will be left alone. I ask the city and the police department to make it a priority and not just leave them alone. Make it a persistent practice to clarify, clarify that these activities will not be tolerated and ignored. Please support us in attracting and retaining a steady base of patrons to the businesses we are all trying so hard to make successful. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, we will go to Zoom. All right, we have one speaker, Shannon. Go ahead, Shannon. Hi, City of Arcata. I wanted to thank you for passing the ceasefire resolution in Gaza um, last month. I wasn't able to come to the meeting where it was passed and by unanimous support and sign. So I wanted to thank everyone on the dais for doing that. Um, I know it's a global issue, but I just wanted to emphasize that we are all connected and we are very much affected by global issues here. Um, stuff that we do here reverberates outside of here in our bubble. And um, I just want to remind the council respectfully that your words do matter and what you say matters. And I know it doesn't seem like this is important, but it's really important to the people. And I think we did make that evident to you by all of our showing of support for the ceasefire resolution, so thank you so much. Um, I know it wasn't anyone's intention, but I read or I heard that someone said, now we can get back to work. And unfortunately, that really hurt my feelings. And I just wanted to say, I don't think it was your intention, but it just come across like dismissive. And it makes it feel like uh, some people's, in, in, um, what people concerns people, what gets people to participate in um, public comment and in local politics isn't as important as others. So I just wanted to highlight that and just hope that there's some time for self respect reflection amongst um, you all to make sure that you try not to do that. But thank you for passing this ceasefire. It's really important, especially when we're watching what's happening right now, it getting worse and worse, and all the poor children, the poor children that are being slaughtered. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let us move to the consent calendar. All matters on the consent calendar are considered to be routine by the City Council and are enacted in one motion. There is no separate discussion of any of these items. If discussion is required, that item is removed from the consent calendar and considered separately. At the end of the reading of the consent calendar, Council members or members of the public can request that an item be removed for separate discussion. A is approve the minutes of the City Council meeting of March 20th, 2024. B is a bi-weekly report on disbursements. C is to schedule a public hearing on Wednesday, April 17th, 2024 at 6 o'clock p.m. or as soon thereafter as possible for the matter to be heard for consideration of adoption of a resolution updating the City of Arcata fiscal year 2024-25 master fee schedule and direct staff to post and publish the public notice in accordance with the California Government Code section 66016 and 6062A. D is to adopt resolution number 234-41, accepting the expansion of a public utility easement from Green Diamond Resource Company on a portion of assessor's parcel number 507-041-001 for water storage tank 1C and authorize the city manager to execute all applicable documents. E is to approve the Arcata Corporation yard fence replacement and trail enhancement plans. And F is to adopt resolution number 234-40, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Arcata, accepting the 2023 General Plan Annual Progress Report. Would any members um, of the Council like to pull an item from the consent calendar? I'd like to pull item F. Okay. Anybody from the public want to pull? E and F? 
Okay, so do we have um, a motion for A, B, C, and D? So moved. Second. All right. Um, we have a motion from Councilwoman Schaefer and second by Councilwoman Stillman. Um, let's start with E. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Sorry, yes, me. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, this is not a, a, a large issue, but I did want to bring it up. Uh, this is about the fence, security fence for the marsh. Uh, no one doubts that a security fence is needed. Uh, the question is the location of the fence. What I want to know is why can't the fence be put back where it was before? That little section of the marsh is a favorite for me and probably many people. It has a kind of a canopy of trees that you walk under, makes kind of a little tunnel. Uh, I can live without it, of course, but the way the new fence is located requires a person to walk along South G Street for about the length of a football field, 350 feet. I recognize that's not the end of the world to do that, but when you go to the marsh, when I go to the marsh, I don't see cars at all. That would be the only place where you have to walk next to a city street. So the decision on where to put this fence was probably made a long time ago. Uh, I'm a little bugged. Um, the, uh, it says the purpose of the project is to enhance public access at the Ox Pond Trail uh, while pr providing for public safety by preventing public access to the corporate yards. That's all true, but that's not really what this project is about. We need the fence, you know, make sure I'm clear, on, we're all clear on that. But what I want to know is why can't it be where it used to be? I think it'll be a better, better path, better marsh. In terms of that, that little section is constricted, but there are other sections right along there that are actually more constricted. So just a little call out for what is one of my favorite little stretches of the marsh. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody want to comment or make a motion for item E? I'll make a motion to approve item E. I will second. Okay, we've got a motion by Councilmember Atkins Salazar and a second by Councilmember Schaefer. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, um, Councilmember White, you want to start off with F? Okay. Um, I just would like to direct um, y'all to page 89 of our packet. While most cities are scrambling to meet our regional housing needs uh, allocation numbers, the city of Arcata has now permitted 79% of our total RENA allocation numbers for housing. So this is above what the city should be at, at 62.5% at this point during our RENA cycle. We now have exceeded our very low income and moderate income with only 12 more units in the low income level um, remaining to happen in this planning period, which is an eight year planning period, 2019 to 2027. So just wanna say great job and a big congratulations to Arcata. Did we have any comment on this, Mr. Daggett, if you wanted to? Okay, so with F, you're uh, accepting the 2023 annual progress re report. I'm gonna direct you to section five, health and safety. This section reviews city progress towards implementing and falling elements, public safety and noise. So I don't know what you're trying to do here. With the, I've been talking about the noise element for the last uh, two and a half years and there has not been any progress at all. There hasn't even been one step forward in that direction. So it's like, I've talked to Karen, I've talked to the police chief, I've talked to the council. So how can you be um, saying that you're, you're making progress on the noise element when there's absolutely no progress whatsoever? So um, as far as the, the safety, um, I've talked about this standpoint from the, the vehicles that are um, going through our streets and nobody's stopping them, um, you know, whether it's muffler or speed, there, is, there has been absolutely no progress at all. So this is completely false. So how can you, I mean, this isn't even the first year, it was last year and the year before, keep repeating and telling to the state that you're making progress on these laws and you're absolutely not. And what's also a little disturbing is last week with the planning commission, this was, this was there too. And they had the air element that was part of it. 
And I haven't really been talking about that too much from the standpoint, but it's just kind of like my experiences living all over California and, and having, you know, smog tests done every annually and, and pointing out that also your EIR said there was very, this was very significant. And now to see this, to, to have the air element just drop completely off this annual report is just a little unbelievable. So um, maybe we have our attorney here, maybe he can answer why the city doesn't think they need to like make any attempt to uh, do anything regarding these things. And you know that it's like, what, what meeting have I not talked about this in the last two years? Um, I mean, I'm sure you're really tired of it. I'm tired of it. And, you know, it's just kind of like, I never thought when I first started this that I would have to be two years later still talking about it. I just thought you would just like immediately, you know, start addressing and do, make some attempt to do it. But for two years later, no attempt at all is just, I mean, I just don't, I mean, I'm just trying to keep pointing you in the right direction to, to go in the right direction. And it's like, what what is going on with the city that I just it's it's just unbelievable. So it would be nice at some point someone could actually address this. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody uh, is there more comment? Yes. All right. Yes. Good evening. Um, I want to thank Councilmember White for pointing out the. Uh, regional housing needs allocation. Um, I'm handing out here that chart, and I'm gonna look at it from a different direction. Uh, from 2019 to 2023, we can see that Arcata has, in an excellent fashion, met its deed restricted, very low, and deed restricted, low income housing needs. This is problematic for a lot of communities. And we have met the moderate housing needs for non-deed restricted housing. But you can see over a five-year period, there has not been a single housing unit of deed-restricted moderate income of apartment or house. Five years, not a single one. And then in the above moderate income bracket, we've seen 94 units out of a total allocation of 262. That's just 36%. This is um, corresponds Above moderate income corresponds to a monthly rent of about $2,200 a month, not very much. This is what we've been told by the realtors. The, the uh, Humboldt Board of Realtors gave a presentation to the Planning Commission. Nothing came out of that presentation. Uh, I mean, they didn't discuss it even one word. Um, I'm not saying this is easy. I'm not saying I have an answer, but I did want to point out to you and to the public that it's at the higher end or, or even the moderate end that we're having our difficulties. Thanks. Thank you. And um, before I, uh, what, what item was that one? E, F, e, F. F, okay. Before I make a motion for that, I just do want to address that. As someone with very good knowledge of the construction industry, I can tell you that is a huge challenge, not only in Arcata, but in our state and the rising cost of construction materials and the very, very um, restrictive laws are playing into that. So Arcata is not unique to that and hopefully something will change because it is a problem. So I hear you. And with that, I'd like to make a mo motion to approve item F. I will second. All right, we have a motion from Councilwoman Atkins Salazar and a second from Councilwoman Schaefer. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, the motion passes, and with that, let's move on to new business. Um, our first item is to appoint one new member to the Wetlands and Creeks Committee for a term expiring March 31st, 2025. Do we have any questions, comments from the council? No, I would like to thank Nathaniel Pope for his applicant and um, make a motion to appoint him to the Wetlands and Creek Committee with a term ending March 31st, 2025. I would second that motion. All right, we have a motion from Councilwoman Atkins Salazar and a second from Councilwoman Stillman. Um, before I go to the final vote, do we have any public comment on this item? All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations. Aye. <laughs> 
glad you could stick around to see that. All right. And now, okay, we are going to move on to re review and approve the revised city officials protocol manual. Can we have a staff report from our city attorney, Doug White? Now the exciting part of the meeting. <laughs> so, um, uh, Mayor and Council Members, um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak with you today on the protocol manual. I think this was one of the items when we first came on board that we kind of wanted to go through and um, uh, make some uh, uh, recommended changes to. Uh, in addition to that, there's really just some areas where it's more of a policy discussion about like how you would want to do it. I do want to say that from the outset, um, the goal has and will continue to be to keep Arcata Arcata. Um, there are certainly unique aspects that you have that um, are different than other clients that we, we represent and we want to preserve those. Um, but at the same time, we also want to um, eliminate confusion and create efficiency by maybe consolidating um, a number of different documents and, and resolutions maybe into one comprehensive set of rules that can be followed uh, throughout the city, whether it's the city council or one of our um, uh, commissions or advisory boards. So with that, let me give you a little bit of uh, flavor of um, you know, w what we're gonna do. We're gonna go through just kind of what it is because um, even though I think most of you will be very familiar with what the protocol manual is or the city officials handbook, however people uh, want to refer to it as. Um, the public may not. So we'll go through kind of what it is and how it's structured first. Then we'll go through some, um, some of the recommended changes that we've made. Um, um, and then there'll be a few things that are some policy discussions that aren't represented on the PowerPoint that we'll go over. And then I think with any comments that you have, um, maybe we'll switch over then to the actual document itself and we can kind of look at those and, and, and address any specifics that you, that you have. So with that, let me kick it off on kind of um, our overview. And so what is it? Uh, it's a document of accepted practices that clarifies expectations of city official members. Um, and I would say it actually goes beyond that. It, it includes members of the public and, um, and how the meeting's gonna be conducted and what's the expectations of them. Um, so it, it's kind of from elected to staff to members of the public. So how the city's business is going to be conducted. And it provides a summary of important aspects of city official activities and responsibilities. Many of those things are just uh, regurgitations of things that are already memorialized in law. Uh, but we want to make it easy for members of the public to have access to it. And also the people who, um, you know, don't do this all the time, have jobs during the day, and they um, want to have a central place that they can go and look and kind of better understand their responsibilities if maybe they're on one of our commissions or boards. So the, in that, chapter one um, is an introduction and overview to the document itself. It talks about that this is a council manager form of government, which essentially means that the city manager uh, administers uh, the city government and runs the city on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then the city council is the legislative um, policy making body. So you guys decide the policy um, and then the city manager um, carries that policy out um, with the assistance obviously of, of city staff and the, and, and the directors and so on. Um, the city's governance is first and foremost bound by um, the codes of the state of California. Um, and the uh, Arcata Municipal Code comes after that. So we, anything that's in, in state code, unless it's been given to us, kind of preempts us. Uh, we're a general law city, so that means that we are, we're governed by the, the government code, un unless there's a specific exemption that we carve it out. So we're not a, uh, for those um, who, who would say, we, we just follow the, the general laws and most of those are gonna be in the, in the government code. Um, the manual part is part of city governance uh, and it has our administrative documents. It has goals, um, it talks about the annual budget, it talks about financial audits, the general plan. Again, this is just a, a repository to have people know kind of what the city does, what the major components are and, um, and helps them kind of ask the right questions if they wanna get information. Chapter two talks about the city council powers and responsibilities. Um, I think it makes clear that irrespective of what your title is, whether it's mayor or vice mayor or major mayor pro tem, um, you all are council members and your votes are all um, equal. Um, and we are bound by a majority vote the, of the council. Um, and it's important to note that that majority vote 
irrespective of how many folks are present, extends to uh, ordinances, resolutions, and expenditures of money. Um, so even if there are four of you here, there would have to be three that would have to, to vote for items like that to, to be passed. But that being said, um, we do live by a majority, and it, even if it's if the majority goes against staff decision or if there's a council member who's in the minority who doesn't like it, um, um, uh, city staff has a legal obligation to take that majority edict and carry it through. Um, and then <clears throat> it talks about how council members should refrain from participating in administrative affairs for the city. Again, we're starting to go through the protocol here. That would also extend to um, um, you know, planning commissioners, uh, other folks on, on different boards. Uh, we don't want council members calling up and saying, hey, stop what you're doing, um, road crew, please go fix the um, pothole in front of X's house um, today. Um, and I've had that happen in other cities um, and, and had to deal with it, but it becomes a very inefficient use of uh, city resources and government can cause waste. It also creates a lot of internal conflict in terms of who uh, we're supposed to, you know, staff is supposed to take direction from, uh, and it really breaks down the council uh, uh, ma um, manager form of government. So we don't want that, and that's why it's in there. Uh, it does, you know, in terms of the council, we talked about the policies, but that's the ordinances that change the municipal code. Um, you, you adopt and amend your operating and capital budgets, uh, your procurement procedures. Um, you appoint your two appointed uh, officials, um, um, employees in, in, in the generic term, not in the literal term because I'm an independent contractor, um, is the city manager and the city attorney. Um, so we're the ones who work directly for you. Um, everybody else works under um, the city manager. Um, and then you also do your appointments for advisory boards. So those are all under your uh, authority. And you have the ability to call special elections to declare emergencies to put things like ballot measures on. Um, uh, and to declare emergencies. And those are separated. Yeah, and I'm sorry, special <laughs> elections and to declare emergencies. So two different different things. Um, and then council members may not uh, be members of uh, other city boards, commissions, committees, or task force. So you can't be a planning commissioner and, and a uh, city council member because those items are going to come in front of you and you're going to be charged with being the final decision maker. Also, um, particularly as it relates to planning decisions, you often act as the appeal body. Um, um, so that's one of the other reasons. Uh, it does not, just to be clear, it doesn't prohibit you from participating in, as a representative of the city on, on you know, like JPAs um, and things of that nature. Um, so for the public's benefit, those aren't inconsistent with what I just said. Um, under your, your existing rules, the mayor and vice mayor rotate every year during the first regular city council meeting in December. Um, and then uh, the mayor and vice mayor will be selected during council members uh, meetings in which election results are certified. These are gonna be amongst the things that we wanna kind of clarify uh, and get some policy direction on. Um, it, it is important to note that despite the fact that you have this established policy under the government code, um, you are allowed to pick your mayors and vice mayors uh, however you determine and whenever you determine. Um, so we just have what I would call guidelines or protocols, but but the council still maintains the authority to make changes as it deems appropriate or fit. Um, and the mayor, uh, while being a, a member of the council, um, um, is is uh, the presiding officer of the council and performs uh, ceremonial duties. Um, they're in charge of running the meeting, things of that nature. But again, in all other aspects, they are um, they are the same as any other council member. Uh, details of the protocol, um, <clears throat> uh, um, so chapter three goes through the protocols related to city staff, equipment use, uh, meeting rooms, um, um, how mail works for council members, uh, the city document library, uh, use of equipment for personal matters. Um, it's prohibited, same thing, you know, for anything that's considered political. Um, it's, that's, uh, prohibited and illegal, so we don't want to do that. So this kind of just lays all, all that out. Uh, chapter four go, goes through financial matters. So this provides for payment of modest uh, stipends and supplemental benefits to members of the city council. None of you will be retiring on your city council um, um, stipend. Um, 
Um, state law does set the level of compensation. Some of those laws have actually changed um, as we've had a difficulty um, in other cities, at least, um, recruiting folks to the council, uh, allowing council members to be paid at a higher compensation level than has been um, uh, looked at in the past. So and that's, that's something we'll probably be looking at um, for you all as well. Uh, council, council members may waive their monthly salaries as provided by state law. However, um, you guys are currently not, your current rules don't allow you to assign that salary to any person or, or entity. Um, and under law, you're required to file your statements of economic interest, which is your form 700. Um, um, and that's just to be consistent with state law. So that's all memorialized there. Um, chapter four goes through the city's travel policy. Um, it goes through the credit card policy if issued, I think, and, and Karen correct, can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you currently do not, um, council members do not, aren't issued credit cards, but uh, we have the policy in place in the event that they ever are in the future if it becomes needed. Right, or if we do a single issuance for yep. say travel at some point, you know, we keep it in there. Yep. Otherwise I can't find mine. <laughs> My credit card no, I don't. <laughs> in the city, I can't find it anywhere. <laughs> there you go, I know. Um, and then chapter five goes to communications. Um, the mayor is typically charged with transmitting the city's positions on policies outside uh, to the um, agencies on behalf of the city council. Uh, again, that's one of the ceremonial duties that they perform. Um, it's important that individual council members never speak on behalf of the city or the city council. Uh, at least as a whole, you are able to speak on behalf of yourself, but you, but it's important that when you do so that you identify that you're speaking on behalf of yourself and not the council. Often on, on positions where um, the city council has taken a position, um, and for instance, if, if, if maybe that council member is in the minority, you know, making it clear that of how the council actually, you know, voted so that there isn't confusion between what they're saying and, um, and the council's at least position. Um, so we so there's some caveats in there as to how we handle those kinds of situations to eliminate confusion uh, and then proclamations are issued by the city council as a ceremonial commemoration of an event or issue and we keep an annual list and uh, we got to see that in action tonight and I, I think um, Arcata has uh, a, you know most of my cities it's, it's the the mayor who does it all and I think you guys have a beautiful process where it's kind of shared so it's something that you know I, I, I appreciate how you guys uh, have a team aspect to I do too. It's a lot of reading. Huh? It's nice to split it up. It is, it is. You don't have to read it all. Um, <clears throat> so uh, chapter five continues to go through prohibited use. Uh, well, we talked about with the elections and then it, and then where we comply with the public record deck. So what you have to keep in terms of your, you know, your records, uh, destruction of records, things of that nature. Um, well, I just, stole the thunder out of my next slide, but um, just all the stuff that you have to keep under the Public Records Act. Uh, chapter six goes over conflicts and, and liability. Uh, local agency officials are defined by state law. They're required to complete two hours of training in ethic principles and laws every two years. Um, they're also required to do sexual harassment training um, and uh, mandated reporter training. City requires that in addition, the council members following receive training um, the following officials are also required to uh, receive ethics training, and, and most of those are going to be required to also get the sexual harassment mandated reporter uh, training, which that's planning commissioners, uh, city manager, um, I'll add city attorney here too, uh, department uh, directors, uh, some mid managers, and then the eco economic development committee. And then depending you know, on, on your particular position in the city, um, you might also be required to do some of those things. So you might have to do the mandated reporter uh, training, so not it's it's not, this isn't a list of everybody, but it's kind of like the um, the macro level of who has to do it. Um, Can again, I we, do a quick clarification, yeah. just since it was on that last slide, and we talked about it, goal setting a little bit, some changes potentially to the economic development committee, yeah. um, if we are able to fund and you know the development of an economic development strategic plan in next fiscal year's budget. Um, we also uh, no longer by law would need to require uh, conflict forms, uh, FPPC forms for Economic Development Committee. They used to long ago have a role around um, <coughs> loans in the city, which they no longer have, and that's why they were originally in that uh, category. So either way, I think we'll probably be shifting to something else and not 
be utilizing that committee in the same way anyway, but even if we did, we could remove that section. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's an important note because, I mean, I think that we need to think of this protocol manual as a, um, a living document, and it's something that as changes are made, we need to kind of continue to keep it up to date uh, and, and keep touching it. So, I mean, I think one of the goals that we'll have is to kind of take an annual look at it and kind of keep it up to date. Um, and then, so uh, again, we're memorializing a lot of things that are uh, in law so that this is a reference for folks, but um, that, you know, the Political Reform Act prohibits public officials from using their position to influence government decisions um, and requires the city to, to keep their conflict of interest code kind of updated. Um, in addition, uh, state law prohibits the council members from being financially interested in contracts. Um, so we'll have any kind of, just, we, we often have discussions about, you know, whether or not folks can vote and sometimes people uh, recuse themselves. Um, when, and I think it's important for members of the public to know just because somebody recuses themselves doesn't mean that they in fact have a conflict of interest. Um, often um, we have folks re uh, recuse themselves just in an abundance of caution. Uh, or there, when there might be, even there, there might not legally be a conflict of interest, but, um, but there might be the perception of one um, in that effort to kind of be transparent and, um, and have a good government that people can trust. Sometimes we do that just, uh, um, in, it, just to be cautious or to, to make sure the optics are right. Um, because what looks like a conflict from a legal standpoint often is not. Um, so. And then, and then regularly we consult um, with with folks um, on any of the committees, not just the city council, if they believe that they have a conflict. So um, any of the committees are should uh, the city council already knows this, but you know if, if any of our other boards or committees or members are ever concerned that they have a conflict, they should um, talk to the director who oversees that committee, and then they can get in touch with me, and we can make sure that they're they don't do anything that they're not supposed to and we're following all those protocols. And I think um, I've been, I, I can personally say, I think, you know, Arcata and the folks I've, I've worked with have been very proactive in, in doing that. So that's, that's given me a, a lot of confidence um, in terms of the compliance. Uh, chapter seven goes into, you know, kind of, because uh, we're talking about a protocol again, interactions with city staff um, and what's appropriate and, 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 and what's not. Uh, again, it's gonna, there's a, a, a bit of redundancy in, in here, but it's, some of this is for emphasis and context. Uh, it, you know, so stating again that the council establishes the policies and priority, but the city manager is gonna be the one who does the day-to-day -day stuff. So those, this is just a list of some of those stuff that the, man, and again, this is, man, city manager does a ton of stuff. The whole book could probably make up the things that the city manager is responsible for. But these are just the high level enforcing city laws, directing daily operations of the city, uh, preparing and monitoring the budget, um, implements policy programs initiated by the city council, and generally supervises the administrative affairs of the city. So uh, all that falls with under the city manager's purview. That's why I like my gig, because I don't have as many things underneath <laughs> me. <clears throat> um, uh, uh, chapter seven kind of goes over the city staff takes guidance from the city uh, manager or from their department director, um, and city. But but it also makes clear that city staff do not um, surrender their right to be uh, politically involved, uh, and employees may privately express their um, personal opinions without, you know, fear of retribution, and they may register vote, sign nomination or recall positions, and they may vote on any of the elections. Again, much like city um, uh, city council, we do have kind of protocols for city staff when they come up that they make sure that they identify that they're talking in their individual capacity as opposed to their capacity of if they were working, for instance, for the city, to make clear that they're, you know, which hat that they have on for members of the, the public who might otherwise be confused, so. Uh, um, it gets into, chapter eight gets into uh, and we're going to spend a little time on this one, gets into our city council meetings. Um, you know, they're held on the first and third Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Um, by majority vote. Again, this is an area we want to talk about a little bit uh, later on. And the council members and advisory bodies may submit items to the agenda, uh, uh, request are reviewed and placed on the agenda with consideration for scheduling concerns. So it, it has to, it, 
so folks can ask for something to be put on, but we still need enough time to be able to do the staff work, do it, and also meet the legal noticing requirements. Um, and requests from advisory bodies should be submitted at least 15 working days prior to the meeting. Again, it, all of this is still subject to the ability to kind of get the work that goes on, because often requests um, can't be, even if we can hit the noticing requirements, the work that needs to be put in to be able to have a, a thoughtful staff report and item um, might take more than 15 days. So it's not that that's been ignored. It's just it's just saying that we need the time to make sure that um, what we put on the agenda is not um, half cooked. And then as it goes to public comments, uh, comments relating to the agenda received uh, after distribution of the packet and prior, shall, uh, uh, and prior to the meeting shall be distributed to the council made available for public inspection at City Hall. Um, uh, at the meeting, the mayor calls for public comment after each council, uh, after each of the council has had an opportunity to discuss an item, um, goes into our time limit, which is three minutes. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what you guys do that, um, again, I think is really unique to, to Arcata and, and um, I think is a wonderful feature, which is allowing the 15 minutes of public comment in the, uh, in the beginning of the meeting so that folks can maybe um, get out. Uh, if they need to and they're not stuck here all, uh, all night uh, on a long agenda in particular uh, before public com comes up later. Um, but that was an issue that when I came in gave me a little bit of heartburn just because not everybody's given the opportunity to talk during that period of time. And so, and it was a question of whether or not that was a, con those items were continuations of each other versus they were their own unique one. And so, you know, I think that that's going to be part of our conversation tonight, but so I'll just kind of give context here. Uh, and then chapter eight is actions at meeting. Uh, council exercises authority through a, through a motion, um, in the, to a motion or adoption of a resolution or adoption of an ordinance. Uh, for general guidance and parliamentary procedure, the council follows Rosenberg's rules of order, which were designed for local government. Uh, as opposed to uh, Robert's Rules of Orders, which, which was, was not designed for, for governments. It was, it's a great set of rules, but um, uh, we do re recommend Rosenberg's because of just it's, it's being really designed for local government in particular. Um, but I think it's important to know that it, it, it's, a, it's a guideline. It's, it's not a mandate in, in the context of we're not also looking to create litigation for the city of if, a, if for some reason there's some minor defect in the motion that that becomes a way to get the city in costly litigation and, and, and invalidate something. So that's that's really the rationale behind using it as guidance, but not having it as a, as a, as a mandate. Um, and then we also the, the mayor is also currently allowed to establish reasonable time restrictions on presentations. That includes use of electronic equipment, uh, media, um, um, which is in media that requires city equipment is not allowed during public comment. So. Um, so those are your current rules. Chapter nine, protocol administration. Uh, the city council will review and revise the protocol manual as needed. Again, I think the goal on a going forward basis is to do it kind of you know annually or at least every two years. Uh, the city council will review and if necessary, revise it um, in July following a city council you know election. Um, that's what's you know currently in there, but we can do it whenever we deem appropriate. Um, and this one says the city attorney shall assist the mayor and serve as the ad advisor for interpreting the city council's adopted protocol. I, I think that I would probably say that that should probably be changed. Um, this is one of the changes that we want to recommend. I think the way that we're currently structured, uh, and just well, and just the way that it, it that it works from a pragmatic uh, perspective is the city manager and the city attorney are a team. Um, and so I think it should be, in my opinion, my recommendation is that it include both positions because I think that's just functionally how it works in the first place. Um, and, um, and the city attorney in this respect, I don't think there's any, there's any unique attribute that, that I have um, um, that the city manager doesn't have. So I, th I think that the, that's one of our recommendations. Well, I would argue there are lots of unique attributes, but um, <laughs> that just the way that the uh, arrangement with the new contract attorney is working, um, we don't necessarily have an attorney at every single meeting. So I think it's more just from a practical standpoint than, you know, it'd be great to have it always. So can I have a question? 
Would you mind pulling the microphone a little closer to your mouth? Thank you. I'm often accused of speaking too loudly, so um, I, it's a, okay. So tell me if that's that's is that better? Okay. So now we're going to get into you know kind of changes. Um, so in terms of changes in the 20, uh, 24 um, protocol manual that we're recommending, we want to clarify. Well, first of all, we want to do a consolidation of, of, of documents and resolutions into one. So we want this to be the guiding document for the city, both for the city, you know, council as well as all other city officials and the conduct of business, you know, of meetings and, you know, for the city general. So in general, so it doesn't matter if you're, you know, what board commission council meeting that you show up, the rules are essentially the same and the way that they're administered is essentially the same. Um, of course, there's going to be different jurisdictions. You know, they have different subject matters, but 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 the way it's conducted would be the same, and the rules would be the same. Um, it would <clears throat> the resolution establishing format and procedure for council meetings, as well as um, so um, as the committee handbook had been combined into the, into this one, and I think that that will um, eliminate some confusion. The for context, the commission and committee handbook was um, a lot pithier. Um, and or and not quite as comprehensive as, as as this one, and so I think that that will be helpful. Um, also, we want to make sure that new council members, um, if we are ever to have any, well, we will have some, but you know when that happens, uh, or their city officials when they um, begin their positions, um, that department head should you know invite them to tour the facilities and meet staff, at least within their relevant jurisdiction. Um, so we want to make sure that that's kind of built in in terms of the protocols. And newly appointed advisory body members receive a copy of this handbook. Again, part of the protocol when you come on board, here's your handbook, here's how we do things. Let me, you know, do you want a tour? Do you want to, do you want to look at stuff um, um, to make sure that they get up and running can, and can operate at a high level, you know, as quickly as possible and obviously in compliance with law. Um, and then mayor and uh, vice mayors now rotate during the first uh, regular city council meeting in December or in meetings in which elections are, um, results are, are certified. So we kind of wanted to clarify how, how that rotation works. I do know that that's, this is an area that you guys might want to have additional conversation, um, you know, about, uh, you know, term links and things of that nature. So I just wrote that out in case that's a conversation that you want to have. And then chapter eight, we want to have a, you know, we'll probably pull up the actual language there and kind of go over your, your meeting format in general one of the recommended changes that I would make that I think would would help is that we um, have a, the regular closed session meeting begin at five o'clock um, um, so that you don't have to keep calling special meetings and having separate notices and separate agendas and things of that nature with and then the regular uh, open session meeting uh, beginning at six I think that that might create a little little bit more might reduce some confusion and things of that nature so we'll We'll, when we, we'll pull up section 8.9 and kind of go over that. Uh, other, uh, other changes are vacancies and advisory bodies uh, will be posted on the city's website and any interested member of the public is invited to apply. So it kind of, again, lays out how this application process would, and vacancy process would be, would, would happen. Um, and it also makes clear that appointees may not serve on more than one uh, body at a time. Um, if you want to change that, that is something that you could that you could change. So somebody could be on like a parks committee and as well as a uh, planning commission. But we, generally speaking, we want to encourage as many people to get involved as possible and have people kind of dig in on their specialties. So unless you're having difficulty filling positions, it's probably not something we would otherwise recommend. We'll ensure that we still have language. Sometimes we have task forces, and the mm -hmm. council has specifically yeah. requested a member from several different committees pertinent to that topic. Yeah, so wouldn't prohibit that. Yeah. Each city board commission and task force decisions and recommendations determined by at least a majority vote of the membership. Um, and then a designated department liaison appointed by the city manager will coordinate all activities between the advisory body and, and the city council. From a practical uh, effect, that happens already. Um, it's just kind of memorializing that in the document. Uh, it goes through um, the terms of office for advise, advisory board members um, that they're staggered to avoid a complete change in membership at the time, uh, at any one time. 
And so this would be the, the recommended um, terms. And then also um, it talks about the fact that the mayor may decrease the amount of time for comment, which um, will apply to all com commenters. And this is um, meant for times when you have uh, maybe more people seeking to speak than uh, there's practical time for um, in, in terms of you know what's a reasonable time to conclude a meeting. Um, it, it does eliminate seating of time during public comment. Um, and it, uh, and the public would only be allowed to place items on the agenda via comment during regular meetings. So it wouldn't be that you would be able to do it some other way. Um, again, this is an area where you could have conversation. Um, um, this is one of the unique Arcata things. Generally speaking, it's only council members or staff who can put stuff on the agenda. Um, and then it, uh, designated waiting areas for speakers um, and then no signs permitted in, in, in this area. Uh, that has to do with the cameras as, as well as making sure that people don't feel intimidated, making sure we have a, um, you know, a intimidation free, you know, hostility free opportunity for anybody who's speaking um, to feel that they can have their voice heard irrespective of what their opinion is. Um, and that also we just want to make sure people can see. So we don't want people with signs sitting in the front row and then everybody behind them just can't see. So signs are going to be allowed. Um, they just have to be in the back of the room and they can't block people from seeing. So pretty simple. Um, and then uh, one of the other changes is uh, each commenter may only speak once during the combined oral and written communication period. Um, uh, we confirm that written communications may not be submitted for inclusion on the agenda. Uh, and then the public may no longer remove items from the consent, consent calendar. They can, of course, um, comment on them, but um, they wouldn't be able to remove. That would be um, uh, reserved for just the council. And then presentations no longer would be allowed during uh, oral and written communication period. There was, <coughs> there was a question that came up about what we refer to as blue folder items. This is, you know, correspondence that comes in specific to an agenda item after the posting of the agenda, and we would still continue to make sure that those are distributed to all of you yep. uh, prior to that meeting. Yeah. And then uh, the other ones is council members may uh, admonish, reprimand, or censure other council members or any other city official for egregious violations of civic norms or other misconduct. So uh, whether it's um, the protocol manual violations or whether or not it's violation, otherwise violations of law, um, it lays out that process um, and what you would need to go through. Um, in addition, it goes through government code 54957.95 where the mayor or the presiding officer of the meeting may remove or cause the removal of an individual disrupting the meeting. This is a newer law that, that went into effect. And so it just kind of mo memorializes both for the public and for, um, you know, the, the council and, and our committees and, and boards, uh, what needs to happen in order for somebody to be considered disruptive um, and be removed from, from a meeting. Um, we hope that that never happens. I don't think it, you know, I, I haven't had it happen yet in any of the city in like almost 20 years of practicing law. Um, gotten close, but but um, um, but we, we wanted it there so everybody knew what the rules are. Uh, council members and city officials are discouraged from wearing political attire or bringing political signs to council meetings. Again, the issue is that we want people to feel uh, welcome and um, willing to share their pers their perspectives and views um, folks wearing any kind of political paraphernalia that identifies them with one political party or one particular candidate that can potentially um, intimidate or get somebody who would uh, who has a different political view to feel like the that the person sitting at the dais wouldn't be open to what they have to say so we kind of so we discourage that at the at the dais doesn't mean you can't do it off the dais. It just means that when you're on here, you, 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 become, you become politically neutral and you're, just, you're on behalf of the city. You're not a Republican. You're not a Democrat. You're not an independent. You're not a Green. You're not anything. You are Arcata City Council members. Um, so with that, 
Um, I think that, that we have gone through the PowerPoint itself. I have a few notes that I wanted to go over, and I also wanted to thank Fred for his comments. So <coughs> um, I did get to go through um, most of it. Um, and so I'll try to uh, – so I want to go over a couple things before we, we dive in. I do, I do want to make sure that um, – uh, folks know that there's definitions in, in the preamble of chapter one. Can I ask, um, so of before course. we start digging deep into this, and there's been a request for a quick five minute break. Yep. So no problem. let's just pause and reflect for a minute. Go ahead. This is a perfect spot. Okay, I think we're ready to come back. Wonderful. So thank you for that presentation. I think I'm going to open it up for the council to comment. I think that let's take some of the ones that might um, warrant a little bit more discussion and might be a little bit more hot button items. So Sarah, do you want to? I have to a really easy one, actually. All right. I said this during the break, but I'm going to say it so the public hears it. Can we change the picture? Because you can't see Meredith's face in it. Okay. 
And then other really small clerical. I want to choose it. <laughs> other really small clerical thing under 8.6B, it talks about Main Street, and Main Street doesn't exist anymore. So okay, we should get I can rid of that. remove that from mine too, because that's what I had also. <laughs> And those were just like my two little small clerical things, and now we can take the big issues. Oh, I have another little clerical one, though, okay. that doesn't take much. It's 3.3, um, and it says that um, <clears throat> the way it's read is that the city provides office space in City Hall, but we don't have office space in City Hall for the councils in another area. So I think we should say that uh, office space will be provided by the city. Oh, and I have a fast one, 3.4, Telefax. Are we using those still? Telefax. Uh, we do have a fax machine, but it's fine to take out your protocol manual. <laughs> so I thought maybe we should take it out because we don't have them like we used to. That was 3.4. I have a, not a hot button issue, because I know there are a few, but um, a, a question for everyone. We do the council and staff reports at the end of the meeting, and I think that's appropriate place for the council reports, but sometimes I feel really bad for staff that sits through sometimes a three hour meeting to give a report, and I feel like oftentimes our attention is, you know, we've had, I think Nature was here recently with, a, with an important report and it was after a really difficult meeting and I just think sometimes they don't get the attention from mm -hmm. us and, you know, possibly the public. So I'm just curious what other people think or what is done in other cities and maybe having the um, reports at the first part of the meeting just from staff. So like it would be like committee, um, staff or um yeah yeah I, well, and i would agree that we should the the with that but also to put the council reports with that because i think that's stuff that the public wants to hear and a lot of times the public has left by that point because a lot of times it's just like you know i'm gonna i'm gonna talk about e-bikes later and probably you know nobody's gonna <laughs> hear that because it was at the end of the meeting and so i i because usually it's pretty quick too so mm -hmm. I, I would be happy to move that whole item to earlier on the agenda. I would agree with that. So um, maybe that, oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead. I was gonna say, maybe that follows up on what I suggested last night is that we have a lot of things happening, but we don't actually know about them. Well, we do, I mean, whatever, whoever knows or not, you know, that we're gonna be closing the plaza off to uh, traffic through traffic for farmer's market. Right now it's one-way traffic on old Arcata Road. All of those things I think are interesting for us all to know and for the public to realize too. And so that's, that was my suggestion when we got a re And so maybe this report can come differently from city staff or from the, mayor, uh, from the city manager. Yeah, and I'm totally fine with that. I just think that as council, when we do report outs, especially if we're gonna do it in the beginning of the meeting before, a whole meeting that we just really be mindful of the amount of time that we're taking to make those reports and keep them um, concise. Well, I have a possible problem with that. Not that I don't mind doing it that way, but I'm just wondering, the end of the meeting is also the time where we can, if something has come up, we can request and vote on an agenda item. So to me, like it's important to have that up somehow, um, have that wrap up with of kind of that open dialogue because that's when sometimes those things are brought up. So I don't know how we handle those. Well, so like on our RCEA agendas, we have reports from member entities at the beginning. So it's like, what's going on if we have anything to report? And then at the end, we have a, an item that is like items for future agendas where we can make those comments of, yeah, if things came up at the meeting or if we wanna set something. And, and to that point, um, under 8.6 when it talks about adding items to the agenda it doesn't talk about using the mechanism of like stating it at a meeting and having consensus to add that and so that is definitely like i feel like the main mechanism that we as council members use for talking about what we want on the agenda is like consensus during a meet at, like at the end of the meeting so um I would like in 8.6 to see some language regarding just, you know, agendized items can be requested like during, you know, via email, during agenda setting, or, you know, through consensus at a, at a meeting. 
or like, I mean, with we've, I feel like we've kind of set a rule that might not actually be an explicit rule in there that like at least two council members at a meeting want it on an agenda or something. And I don't know what the rules kind of around that, that are specifically, but like, I feel like that's kind of what it de facto is, but. Kimberly, Jeff. Yeah, um, I just wanted to um, concur. That was something that on my list is that at the end of the meeting, a lot of people are distracted and ready to go and feel like um, the, particularly the staff deserve our full attention and would love to move that forward as well. Okay, so looking to place uh, staff reports right after committee report. Yes. Okay. And there are a lot of different rules. I mean, Doug chime in, um, but there are a lot of cities that do require you know, at least one other person or two other people or a majority of the board to have an item placed on the agenda. That has not been a rule in Arcata, uh, but I think we have ended up with the practice of trying to get some nods and some consensus at the end of the meeting. So I think working that in is good. Yeah, I mean, just to kind of, this is one of the areas where you guys are, are different, right? Um, so because you even, like when you go through 8.6, when it talks about on C, members of the public, uh, it says a member of the public may request an item be placed on a future agenda while addressing the city. If the issue is placed on it, we'll notify the requester so that he may, may uh, plan to attend the meeting. So typically, <clears throat> we, we wanna make it clear that, that, you know, that that can only happen by council members or staff, right? So that's the, that's the, the big thing that we want to do if you guys want to vary that and you want to have it be multiple um, multiple people then um, then we would just need to to memorialize it but it would make it difficult to do that then by email or any other method it would really have to be at a council meeting because what we don't in, inadvertently want happening is is wind up people bumping into Brown Act violations because it's basically then you'd only be allowed to talk to that one person if that one and if that one person said no then then you're kind of you're kind of stuck well I mean I feel like people can say whatever they want in public comment so they can still say we would like to see right I mean can't the public voice in their public comment I would like to see this on the agenda and then oh no no I, yeah, I didn't mean to do that I'm just saying that if it gets into this if you get into a multiple council member uh, placing something on the the you know the agenda it just creates a little bit of con, you know confusion so it just if we do it we just need to memorialize that it if it's if my recommendation is if you go to a multiple council member scenario that it has to be done at a council meeting and that we eliminate the email phone call situation because i think it also eliminates the ability to to be accused of like brown act violations or things of that nature so um there are lots of cities that do it I have about half of my cities that probably require at least two. I don't have anybody who requires more than two um, to place something on the agenda. So of those who do, we just have a rule in place that, that any agenda item um, that doesn't come from staff requires two council members approval. Um, and so that's what I would recommend. Or it's any council member can request it and then it can be via email basically any form of communication uh, in advance of the meeting. Well, if um, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to think about, we all work really well together and we, are, we work well with city staff and the city manager, but we won't you know, all always be in these seats and it'll, you know, things change. And, so I'm, and we did you know, have issues in the past that we're trying to really think ahead and protect future bodies. So I'm not concerned about us, um, but um, I guess my question was if it takes, I think I like the idea of it taking two people, but if it does, let's say I want an item on the agenda. And so I asked Sarah, Hey, could, would you like to sponsor this with me? And she says, no, well, I can't now go to somebody else. I'm out of luck. So, um, but then again, uh, our, proto, our protocol is kind of tough anyway. And then how does agenda setting fit into all that? Because that's just the mayor and someone else. So I think if you move to... items, like I think you discussed about uh, having those items moved somewhere around ceremonial matters or after committee reports, um, then we'd, I think what we would do is exactly, you know, what um, 
council member Schaefer said, which is have um, an item at the end where it talks about uh, future agenda items I or like items that. for future agendas. <clears throat> and so that's the place in, in which you'd say, I'd like to do it. And then you just go and see if there's another person who wants to do it. Again, if you want to require two and you don't want to have it done at the meeting, it, you absolutely have a legal right to do it. It just, it raises the prospect of running into a Brown Act issue if somebody's winds up inadvertently calling around and saying, hey, I want to put this on the agenda, will, will, will you do it? Well, I think in the public setting, when we're at the end of the meeting, it makes sense to have two people because if, if I want to put something on the agenda and nobody else wants to put it on there, then that says something, right? But our um, outside of the meetings, we um, typically, like I would email the mayor and say, hey, you know, I'm interested in this, this is why, and then it's up to her to consider it. So in the, and, and so, she, and so is this okay? So say I propose something to Meredith and she's like, you know, and this, well, this happened to me when I was the mayor. So I'll use my own example. I had a council member, not here, who would propose things to me and I would say, no, I'm not putting that on the agenda. And so then in the meeting, that council member would say, hey, I think this should go on the agenda. And the rest of the council would say, no, but th is that oh is that okay? That's not a brown is that's not a brown act. So like you could go for a second try. If the mayor doesn't want to hear you, that's the mayor's prerogative. But then you could still bring it up right at the end of the meeting. You can still bring it up at the end of the okay. meeting. You would not be able to outside of the meeting ask another council member. I think that's the cleanest way that's that, very that process of doing it. Okay, so then we would memorialize a rule that would allow. Um, two council members um, to communicate that they'd like to, well, for lack of a better term, sponsor an item for the agenda. Um, and then uh, if it's just so, so that we all walk through how it would function, if you've contacted somebody and that person says no, that they're not willing to sponsor it, then your only remedy then would be to bring it up under this, what we'll call this new future agenda items. And then to see if anybody at the council meeting would be willing to sponsor it. well yeah but you could still just like me as an individual I, I just have to go to the mayor with my request because i can't get a second person because that's a brown act so me requesting directly to the mayor you know we do that i haven't done, requested an agenda item in a long time does that make sense maybe you can explain it better karen yeah, I mean, I, I think often this come, this does come up quite a bit, and they're really small items. They're typically ceremonial. Somebody wants a quick proclamation. They, they talk to one of the council members. The council member emails the mayor, hey, can we get this on the next agenda? It's timely. Here's the issue. And then, and then it goes on the agenda. Now, the tricky piece is, is that our agenda setting is always the mayor, and that's why the requests always go to the mayor and CC to the city manager. Uh, and then we rotate a council member through agenda setting so that everybody kind of stays fresh at what's you know coming up and that everybody has a chance to meet with the mayor and myself to set those agendas on a rotating basis. Um, so if you know if the mayor and that whoever that rotating council member decides it's not going to fit on this agenda, this agenda is just getting too long or whatever it is, you know it might not make that particular agenda. If it's really time sensitive, it might. Um, but so I think that this concept, would work well. I think we can work it out where um, where those easy ones that just are time sensitive or come to one council member, not all of you, we can still get on the agenda. Yeah. So at least what I'm hearing is we would just memorialize it so that it would be a council member can ask the mayor and then that would be the, the, that. So it wouldn't be going to another council member. If it's going to be a council member other than the mayor, then that has to be done at the meeting in public under future agenda items. Is that? I, I think that's, that's what great. we usually do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, all right, I think that, <clears throat> absolutely. Hard. Um, that does not preempt though, say for example, you didn't think about it until the meeting and like, wow, this should be on the agenda. You can still do that even though you have not, okay. Yeah, no, you could, you could come up with the idea right as that agenda item come up and say, hey, I'd like to put this on the agenda and see if somebody else would be willing to, again, loosely using the word sponsor with you tonight. So if we're ready for another topic, I say, yeah. yeah, I think that okay. we should move on to, let's get 8.7 over with. Okay, well, I uh, can I do, <laughs> before you go into it, council member, just, just for the public, um, because we're going through a lot of stuff and I want to make sure folks know that they're going to have an opportunity 
they're going to have an opportunity to comment. This is a draft. We're not taking any action to adopt anything tonight. So the comments that we're doing is just trying to figure out what's going to be memorialized. So I don't want anyone to think that you guys are making final decisions that um, before the public has the ability to, to, to talk. So I just wanted to get that out there before we go too far. So what I, I wanted to explain one thing. So when I was on the council before, I would sit here at the meetings and I would watch people out in the audience. They really only wanted to speak on one thing. It happened this evening when we had a, a, a property, well, she was a business owner and she came and she spoke about the plaza. And so that is how I brought that up, is something that we could have at the beginning after we do certain things. We would have that to allow people not to have to stay till the end of our meetings. Also, um, you know, our meetings, because when we had Michael Mocky was on the council, he came up with a 10.30, that was the end of the meeting. In my past, past, you know, I would have been used to meetings that went to midnight or whatever, and I just couldn't see people sitting in the audience that long if, like Natalie, just wanted to get up and say something quick. So um, that's where that came from, <coughs> and now it's part of what we do. But I don't know if we do it correctly, because I always think about it as for someone not to be talking about the same issue twice at the beginning and the end, but is there just to deal with a, something quick? That yeah. So I think that this, I think you, you, you teed it up perfectly for me to have the conversation that I wanted to have tonight about the two public comment periods that you have. So from, as a city attorney, the only thing that, the, the thing about it that gave me, so one, I want to say that I think it is, a fabulous idea. I, I wish more of my cities would, will now still, hopefully some of my cities will now still the idea and incorporate it into, um, in, into their processes. So, uh, and I think it's one of the things that makes Arcata different and great. With that being said, what I worry about is that whoever gets to speak during the first period of time, since it's time constricted, um, they get, a time, they get the opportunity to speak at the second one and other people who might have wanted to speak, and I've been at a couple of meetings where that's happened, um, they're denied that opportunity to speak twice. Um, and so it raises the concern about if this is really public comment, then it really is an item that's probably, the latter item is a continuation of the first, but it is, it's, it's the opportunity to let somebody talk about that single subject and get in and kind of get out so that they can go home and have dinner and things of that nature and not be here, here all night, um, as opposed to maybe a more elongated conversation or when we have a lot of people here on one particular issue, whether it's a development project or a social issue. So um, I, so in my opinion, the way I, I, I view this and the way that, that I would recommend it is that the 15 minutes is an early opportunity. And if you take that, then you get a smaller time period, so you get two minutes instead of three. You can have the three, but you just have to wait till the later time period to do it, so that the, as many people as we can possibly get who have that kind of short conversation that they want to have can have the opportunity to, to speak and then go home and possibly have dinner um, with their families. Because in the past, what I noticed it was that people would, uh, they would go, oh my gosh, your meeting is so long and I have to wait yes. and they have to go home and feed their children or they just got off of work. And so that's why I thought it was a valuable situation. And I, I would like it to continue for the purpose it, that I thought it was originally started yeah. for. So there is no recommendation that eliminates it. Um, we, would not, we, we would not do that. All we're doing is, is tweak, the suggestion is only that we tweak it so that the first public comment period um, and the public comment period at the end of the meeting are effectively, the, they're the same agenda item, just one is a continuation of the other. It's just if you speak during the first 15 minutes, then you don't get to speak again, and you accept the fact that you're gonna talk a little bit shorter period of time, so you get two minutes instead of three, and you do that knowing, so that, um, that, may, so that if you wanna just kind of raise a couple issues and go home and feed your kids, then you have the opportunity to do that. Yeah, I think, I mean, I would hope that that would encourage more people to come and make public comment. I know that I've talked to several people this week that I've encouraged to come in and make a quick public comment about, you know, something and then get out. And so I, I would hope that this would be able to encourage more diverse kind of people to come and talk about their issues, knowing that, you know, they have like two minutes to say what they need to say and then, and then go. Yeah. 
But I just want to be real clear. The, the, the only legal concern I had with it, if, it, if there are two agenda items instead of a continuation of, of one, is that is it, it's so time restricted and not everybody can take advantage of the first one. So then we're kind of so are inadvertently you, picking Are you paper. saying like I come in, I have my two minutes and I'm going to talk to you about housing. The housing I don't like or the housing I like. And then my two minutes are up. Now I'm going to just stay here and I will start my conversation where I ended it on my page. You know, I wrote this, read that. No. And I'm no. Going to start here no, and no, no. With the so you only get to speak once during, during, what, during public comment. You only get to speak once, um, but you get to choose. If you want to go early, you accept the fact that you're going to get one minute less <clears throat> so that we can accommodate more people. And if you want to talk longer, then, then you, you have to you can, you have, you'll be restricted to the, the later time frame. And then we don't have a situation where some people get to speak twice and some people who wanted to speak twice only get to speak once. Well, I think that's the part that we need to really focus on because that is, that's the spirit of what we're talking about, about public comment, right? So if we wanted, the, if we wanted to have two public comment times, then the first one would need to be open-ended just like the last one is. And so we're, making, we're just evening the playing field and making it fair um, by what is appropriate within the law. But we don't have a time restriction on the last public no. comment, so you could be, we could take people for an hour, two or three hours. Right, and I think what Stacy's saying is that if we had two separate agenda items that we would have to do the same in the beginning too, and we don't want to do that. We never get anything done. We're going to take public comment on the thing as a whole in a little while. So, so, so to be clear, and this is an existing rule, this is not something new. Under 8.7.1, uh, the city's basic standard is to provide three minutes per speaker for all business items. So that would, that's just the standard. So there is a time limit that's, that's in there even for all, all of them. I think I was meaning like hours, right? It could be three, it could be three hours at the end and we can't, We'd right. have to allow up to three hours at the beginning. Well, I think, but then if you go further in here, that it says that we can put a limit on it and a time limit. Yeah. So, do I mean, are we happy? Are we satisfied with the beginning part of the conversation? You want to get into the, you know, changing time? You mean the two, two minutes versus three? Is that what you're talking about? Well, let's say that there's a topic that we've got a room full of people mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that we accommodate them, then should the mayor be able to say, all right, I see the 100 people that want to talk. I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to talk. So instead of three minutes for this item, I'm going to give people one minute or two minutes. Mm -hmm. So, and I think... Yeah, so that, that, that's pretty no normal. I mean, generally speaking, we get nervous about cutting um, time less than three minutes. Um, the only reason that we can cut it to two is in, in the beginning from a legal perspective and feel comfortable about it is because people aren't required to take advantage of that. It's just there for them if they want to. And, and, it, and we're trying to accommodate a lot of people. Um, that being said, the Board of Supervisors all the time, they operate with time limits for agenda items. And so we're legally allowed to do that. It's yes. just that the cities don't, generally speaking, do that. And so. yeah, exactly. And to be clear, I mean, there have been many, many instances where we have had three hours. It's just because it says we can do it. I don't think I can think of a circumstance where it would happen because we want to hear everybody. But I don't think we've had 100 people in here. But if that should happen, I want to make sure that we had the, that we were allowed to do that. Yeah, I think that's been a long time practice for Arcata. I've seen it happen many times where we have lots of people and we make an announcement. We're going to try to get through public comment in one hour, in two hours. Can I have a show of hands? I mean, we've certainly, that's a pretty common practice for us. Yeah. Um, ju just to bring up on maybe another point, maybe this is a technicality and maybe it doesn't even need to be in this because I feel like there's not a lot to talk about Zoom, but thinking about then if we're continuing this early oral communications piece and the idea is make a quick announcement so you can go home, people already sitting at home should probably not be able to comment during the first part because, right, that it's like the quick announcement, right? And that, so, so I, I, I don't know how other people feel about that, but like, you know, I've seen times where we have 10 people lined up in here for early oral communications, but I have to 
to tell four of them to sit down because we have people on Zoom that then again comment later and are just at home. So, I mean, I, I, I just, for, for the spirit of this kind of like make a quick announcement and make your quick point and, and go home, that maybe we reserve, you know, Zoom. But, and, and I understand why that might go the other way for folks. So I just wanted to bring that up as a point and see what people thought. But. Well, I would counter with um, making sure, since we're only allowing it to be like a one-shot deal, and still limiting it to 15 minutes. I mean, could we get everybody that wanted to talk that was in person? And then if there's like five minutes left, maybe go to Zoom? Or is or now, is it just I like mean, you, you could build a policy that, that prioritizes people in the chambers. And then if there's time left over, then allows that, you know, for Zoom. But, um, but then under that scenario, if the folks in the chambers um, took the entirety of the 15 minutes, then then the folks on Zoom would wait until then. And my only other thought about that too, of just to, you know, kind of say, yes, this is another reason we should do that, is that like, it's pretty easy to be multiple people on Zoom and comment twice if you want to, you know, and not respect that rule. So again, I don't know how many people are busting down our, our doors to, to comment at our meetings, but well, it, it could happen. But we're also thinking ahead for, you know, for the future. I mean, there have been, there are council meetings that now are not doing Zoom public comment anymore because of the reach that Zoom has. And you can have um, somebody mobilize 600 people to come to your meeting. And so we probably shouldn't have said that out loud, but we haven't had that happen. But there are, you know, cities that don't do Zoom comments anymore. And, you know, we are still able to do that. So I think you know, having the first one be in person only is fine with me. That makes sense. Your logic makes sense. I don't know what um, Kimberly or Alex I, thinks. I Not only, but prioritize. And yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I like the idea of prior prioritizing those that are here. Um, we do that in businesses. When you call a business, they take care of the people at the counter first. So that's what I wanted to say. Do we want while we're on this section? Are there other changes that you are interested in making in your overall order of business from land acknowledgement, flag salute, roll call, ceremonial reports by commissions and committees? We will then go to staff and council reports. So, do, do, you all, do normally cities um, have an end to their meeting time, 10 30? No. I mean, I mean, if they do, it, it, it's, just, it's just kind of a uh, kind of a aspirational statement that they're going to try to have the meetings uh, concluded by a certain time, but generally speaking, they won't. They won't. Okay. Yeah, I think we've had long meetings, and then once we get to a certain time, there's a general, like, poll to see, all right, do we want to just keep going and get it over with, or do we want to pause and reschedule? So I think that's appropriate to just take a read of the room. I mean, mm -hmm. if we're if it's 11 and we're fading, then I think it's completely appropriate well, to say. Yeah, right now it's 1030. And that was something that Michael Mockey, when he was on the council, put together because he liked to go home early <laughs> and go to bed. Anyway, that's what he would say to me. And, um, and I felt like sometimes that we had developers that would be in the audience, and they would sit through our long meeting. And then he'd say, it's 1030, we have to go. Like, you cannot do this. You cannot have a develop. We're going to have different doors, different windows, different roof. You can't do that to people waiting in the audience. So, since I've been on the council this time, we haven't had that kind of in, you know developers in our audience, maybe once. No, but we have had where like it was. We've had a couple of meetings where it's 10:30 and we have to take the pulse and see. And we've we've known we're close to the end, so we've gone through. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's using our judgment because it's not just us; it's the public. The public has to, <clears throat> most people have to work the next day too. So, you know, we could essentially put something really controversial at the end of a five-hour meeting, and that wouldn't be very fair to people mm -hmm. watching. So ending at a reasonable time on a work day is, I think, common courtesy. I, I know I agree with it, but I, I agree that, but my feeling was then that bothered me is that we could not postpone for maybe three weeks because you had a five-week month, mm -hmm. and you're saying, well, we'll take it up, you know, but now you have to wait three weeks. Yeah. So I'm not complaining about it. I just think we have the option to poll everyone and say, let's finish this item. So would you prefer it if we maybe soften the language so it just said, we'll make every you know attempt to, 
to finish around 10.30, so it's yeah. not considered a mandate? I think it's appropriate at 10.30 to look around and take the pulse, and you know, in special circumstances when there's people that are waiting to, to speak in the audience, and absolutely, and I think that, I don't think, I've been on the council at a time where we've stopped a meeting and rescheduled. I think we're pretty tenacious. Lucky. I know. <laughs> Well, <laughs> so, so the only thing that's on here on 8.9 that I want to just draw your attention to because we've had criticism about there being inconsistencies is, is the land acknowledgement and the flag salute being followed by each other um, was brought up at a previous meeting. And so if you guys wanted to have any conversation about okay, I, that. Can you repeat what you said? There's a bit. Sorry. Sorry. I, sometimes I talk fast. Um, um, the only thing on 8.9 that I did want to bring your attention to to see if you wanted to have any conversation of it, and it's because members of the public have criticized us of being inconsistent by having the land acknowledgement and then the flag salute following right after. So I just wanna bring it up as a matter of topic to see if you wanna have any conversation about that. You know, and that, that was generated just from comments from the public. Yeah, uh, that's what I was gonna say, where else would it go? I guess we could do a land acknowledgement roll call flag salute, but we're, we're still gonna do both and you know there have been meetings where yeah people have criticized it jeered about it where it's felt really awkward to to read one and go into the other um and to go into the other and then stand up there and not say the flag salute also feels really awkward um so i you know but where is it gonna go you know is and maybe that's a question to you guys i mean yep. do, you, do you see or or other cities that you're in what do they do? Maybe you don't have any cities that do land acknowledgements. I don't know. I don't have any cities that do land okay. acknowledgement. That's another ar 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 um, Arcata thing. I, again, I only bring it up because we're at this section right now. It's been something that we've heard from the public. So I'd rather have the conversation and then, um, and then we can just move on. Do you have cities, uh, do all cities do the Pledge of Allegiance? Uh, I do. I don't, I don't I, all my cities do the Pledge of Allegiance and I have Thank one you. city that does an invocation. Well, and we've also been accused of being an illegitimate government. So, I mean, we're, the, the, <laughs> the accusations will always be there. We're trying to genuinely do the right thing, and maybe we're not doing it perfectly, and it's a work in progress, and hopefully as time goes by, we will find ways to make it not performative and to do better at that, which is our intention. And so we just have to know that it's not a perfect setup, and we will be criticized, but we're trying. Um. Um, should we go down? I think there's a list of like stricken things on 8.7.1. Do we want to go down and kind of touch all of those? Um, let's talk about seating time. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm good with striking that. Yeah, as I've said before, I think that gives people that come to meetings all the time an advantage over people that don't and people that don't know that you're allowed to do that don't know that you're allowed to do that and then they don't do it and it's not fair, so... I don't think we should allow seating of time, and I know plenty of other bodies that don't either. Do you guys have opinions on seating time? I don't know. Do you want to go first? Sure. I don't think we should seat time, personally. I think the person that seats time should speak. Yeah, well, yes. I'm, I'm, it happens with Fred a lot that somebody will stand up, I'm going to cede my time to Fred. So that means he gets six minutes instead of three. And often I think that person that cedes his time should actually give us their opinion and and not be ceding their time to someone else. Or not. That's and they where just I not come from. Talk, yeah. Kimberly, do you have anything to add? I guess my thought is if you are ceding time and several people do it, then the people, the, I guess I want to level the playing field and have an opportunity for everyone who came here to have an opportunity to speak. However, if there is nobody else here, I don't really see a problem with seating the time. It's got to be equal across the board. You can't just say, oh, there's only three people here. Fred, you can talk for 20 minutes if you want, you know, Let, let's hang out. Like, no, that's when you go get coffee with somebody and, you know, have a conversation and this isn't necessarily the, the place for, for that, well, so. I, I, um, I've never noticed that before until I've been, you know, we've been on some conversations and some of them I'm not in the room for because I have to go in the other room, but um, there's a lot of seating time and I, I just don't think it's appropriate personally. 
to Sarah's point, um, we did have someone do their, they received 20 minutes to do a presentation. And of course we've discussed that we're not gonna be able to do that anymore either. But um, I guess, you know, if, if we could put a cap on it so that, you know, you're not gonna be able to see time for 20 minutes or whatever. But, you know, maybe getting an extra three minutes on something that you're passionate about and there, um, nobody else is here. I'm not quite sure, like, if you could make a rule of, if there are other speakers, then you cannot see time. Let those people who are here should have the opportunity to speak. And after everyone who wants to be heard has been heard, and I don't know how you would do that, though. So, so the way that um, most of my cities would handle that would be um, the council, uh, that the speakers are allowed to ask for more time, and um, the, it's always up to uh, majority of council as to whether or not to grant more time. So well, but that's more reasonable. They can say, like Fred says, you know, may I have five minutes instead of two or three, whatever he gets. And you, we're using you because you do. It happens all the time with Fred. So it happens often. And I can see asking for more time, but not for me jumping up and saying, I'm going to cede my time to Fred. I know that nobody means well, but I'm just not comfortable. Thanks for being a good sport, Fred. But it just when we're using him as an example, it, it feels to me like it could feel like we're making up this rule about him. And I and I and and so I just I'm not comfortable using people's names associated with this. Okay, the gentleman in the audience. No, <laughs> it's the same thing. No, I'm sorry. I, 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 I think that we name. need to be consistent across the board. I mean, I think that's a protocol manual. Protocol manual is about consistency. I think that we need to keep things as clean and consistent as possible. And, you know, right now we only have, I, and like we've said over and over again, <coughs> right now is right now, but we are thinking about future issues and future things. And I just think as clean and consistent as possible um, is appropriate. Does, Everybody feel comfortable like pausing and taking some public comment. I think we've gotten through some pretty contentious. Well, I feel like we should wait till the end so they can hear all the things we're discussing Fair in enough. case there's things that uh, you know people want to comment on. Okay, that sounds good. What's up next? So I had a two. Uh, I had an idea. I mean, a thought is that uh, we have our land acknowledgement. Is there any way that we could have it on the screen and then not read it? I'm. I'm just asking that question. If would that, I don't know how the council feels about that, but I've, I've thought about that in the past, and I just thought it. I like this having is an it on the to Bring it up. I like having it on the screen. I also like reading it. I think we can do both if it's appropriate. Um, this might be a terrible idea. I don't know, but I wasn't. I'm just thinking of what Alex said. If First of all, with whatever we do, we already we arrange this through the tribe. So if we make any changes, we need to consult the tribe on it, right? But if we feel like it, I think what Alex is suggesting is we display it instead of reading it out loud. We could see how they feel if we displayed it and just took a moment of silence and reflection, so people could, um, you know, I don't know if that sounds really hokey, but I, otherwise just putting it on the screen seems weird. So I feel like we either need to read it or we need to have an action associated with it being on the screen. We can't just flash it up there and not do anything. I think that once we've already started reading it, we can't not read it anymore. Okay. Um, well, I guess, does anybody have anything else on, on any of eight? Because I would maybe take us to, to mayor selection and rotation yeah. and some questions about that if folks want to. And I, I have stated this before, and I'll state it again, and I don't know how other people feel about this or if this is a popular or unpopular opinion. I don't like the rotation. I think it's clunky. I think it's silly. I think it was created to placate somebody years and years and years ago. And I know it was <laughs> created to placate somebody years and years and years ago. And I think that like as a well-functioning board who like works with each other often and knows how we operate and knows who's good at leading meetings and who hasn't done it yet and who has experience, who doesn't have experience, you know that like I think we should be able to choose from ourselves, but I don't know how other people feel about that. I don't know. I just 
the, the rotation, because I feel like a rotation like this happens naturally anyway, like among most, like with the, my JPA that I'm on, like this is exactly what just happened. And like the, you know, the person that has been serving the longest that hadn't served as chair yet becomes chair and then they nominate the next, the vice chair, you know, and so I feel like this kind of naturally happens anyway, but I don't know what folks think about it. I have some ideas. People, like when I talk to community members or, or like, like when I went to Civic Well, like talk to other elected officials, they're like, you guys do what? And then also just my one other thing about it as having been mayor for a year, it, it was kind of nice for it to be over, but also it's really hard to get a grasp on being the mayor in only a year. And that like, I think two years of mayorship might be better just for developing leadership qualities and developing a board as like a working group of people and for communicating and reaching out to the community and like other partners. Like I still get emails from like, you know, the state board on this and hey, Mayor Schaefer, what do you, uh, sorry, I'm not the mayor anymore. You're gonna need to talk to this person. And so it, it is difficult and you know, maybe I'll defer to, we've got a whole lineup of, of, of mayors here of, of just like how, how that felt. Cause I do, I do think it is kind of, you know, whatever. And I, well, sorry, one last thing. There was a, a comment in, in an email from a community member that did say to kind of counteract the, the clicking and the like favoritism that could exist with this to make it voted by supermajority. And I do think that's like appropriate if, if it is decided then in like a 4-1 vote instead of a just simple majority. So those are my thoughts on mayor selection. Okay, so I do hear when you've been a mayor, sometimes you feel like you just got your feet wet. But again, to level the playing field and having everybody have the opportunity, how can you get experience unless you give them the opportunity to have the experience? I would suggest if you want a second shot at the mayor to run again and you will be rotated around once again. I'd also like to, to point out to what you were saying is what one of the um, constituents wrote in is this rotation system was put in place, I think, to not just because, I, I, what was it, to, um, I don't remember what you said, but I think that it was there for a check and balance so that we could avoid those clicks. Mm -hmm. So that um, so that if somebody disagrees, contrary to the majority, and maybe has a dissenting voice, it would be very easy to mayor them out so they don't ever get a chance to be the mayor. And, and I speak about this because I am often that dissenting voice and I do wanna have a, ch a chance at being the mayor. Um, you know, after it, I have, you know, time here and, and an opportunity to learn more and gain more experience. Um, but I think that's what makes up a city council is that we do offer differing opinions and we don't always have to do, agree. But my concern is without that check and balance, and I'm not saying that would happen here, but we don't know what future councils will do, that it'd be very easy to excommunicate a particular person because they don't agree with your thoughts. So that's my, what I want to say about that. Well, I agree. Um, I think that being the mayor is puts you in a in a spotlight. That's it's tough. It's a tough place to be in, you know. And so I feel like you do get a little more focus on you when you are the mayor. And so I feel like that's the community's chance to see the, the, who you voted and how they're how they're leading, right? So if I never get a chance to be mayor, um, then my the people that support me wouldn't really see like how how I can do in that hot seat really leading things. So I do think it's an important, it really gives you a chance to see where, you know, where you are. My question is, because what if, and, and, and again, I'm not talking about this council at all, but is there a mechanism put in place so that if I am the mayor and I am a disaster, um, <laughs> can my colleagues vote me out? I think that needs to be in place so that, because that would be a really tough thing to do. So you, the mayor would have to be a pretty big disaster, I think, for the rest of the council to want to bring that kind of attention. We, we, yeah, we did. And, well, no, he, he stepped out. Well, so that's actually what, that's actually well, whatever, what happened but, before. Yeah, so I just want to make sure that, every yes, everybody should get a chance, but, if the council thinks that they need, you know, if they can't, if it's not working, 
can we make a change? Could we hear from the city attorney and how you recommend handling that? Yeah, so uh, it, it's actually in there. That was one of the things that was one of the things that um, we talked about. Uh, we specifically have the government code in there. We're still a general law city. Um, if and if if and when uh, that was to ever happen, then you could the council could take action. All you have memorialized here right now is your guidelines, your protocols. You still have the ability to, to vary and do anything that you that you want at any given time. Um, I think what it does is it lets people know what the expectation is, and if there's a deviation to it, it probably shines a brighter light on it. So. Yeah, I also, I like the rotation. I'm happy with by one year. Um, how, what month is it? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, That's fine. I was just bringing it up, and no, I'm, no. I'm glad that, no, I'm, I'm glad to hear from you guys, and I do appreciate these, these viewpoints, but, but it's fine. But I do think that we, this year, are in a, interesting position in that we have the person that's technically up for rotation next the language is a little gray right and so i think that we should change it um to in like the the this period that they were elected in you know what i mean like because alex has obviously been mayor before but she hasn't been mayor since she's been elected this time so i think we should kind of make sure that there's some clarity around that yeah i'll just share um, when this was instituted uh, it, the concept was at least contiguously so if you took a break then you started over in that rotation as though you had never been mayor before but if you were did two terms uh, then you might step aside to you know then the idea is if you did two consecutive terms uh, and you just happen to come up for rotation, then it would likely go to the next person. We haven't had that happen yet. Uh, this is probably, actually, it's not ancient, ancient. It's only like five years. Uh, so we've only, I think we've only rotated four, five times, Bridget? I don't know. But. I think we rotated like four four times well in, in one year time. yeah we did. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no i just want to be clear that i'm happy with the rotation but i just and i'm excited for to see everybody in here in a mayoral position and yeah. well i'll just go back in the 70s when i was in the council i was the mayor for the four years and so when it was over it was so dan hauser became the mayor it was so hard you get so used to calling for the question you know it's I know, just still <laughs> i know it's really hard and then I, so I, the only way I could concentrate not to, you know, always be, you know, doing that is I would bring my knitting and I would sit and I would knit. So I, you know, I was not doing that. And then people would say to me, why are you so unhappy? Because <laughs> you're always looking down because I was trying to break that habit. It was a hard habit to get rid of. I probably still do it, but not intentionally. I've had a lot of time since then. To break up. Could I ask you to repeat that part? I'm sorry, I missed some of it um, about the um, when somebody's coming up for two contiguous uh, terms. Yeah, it's actually already in the manual. It says the member with the most continuous time in service. So the intent is if you did one term and then you took a whole term, you know, let's say you took four years off and you came back, then and let's say you did serve mayor in that first term. That, that part is done and behind. If you're reelected after a four-year break, after a two-year break, um, you start over in that rotation as though you've never been mayor before. And I think it's captured. I mean, we can clarify it more, but it does say a member with the most continuous time of service on the council. Now, if you did, because, for example, Council Member Schaefer brought up, she wasn't ever supposed to be mayor. And here she is now city mayor, ha done being mayor halfway through her term, or <laughs> a little bit more than that, you know. Um, but in that case, you could have, you know, if, if in that situation, um, well, I guess in this, that's, that's a bad one. But in, in that situation, if she was reelected after four years, she would stay in that rotation, right, and probably be next at that point. Um, but now that she has served, she could run again and potentially if there was somebody else, let's say, I mean, it really only happens if you end up with a turnover probably of three council members at a time, mathematically. Um, but that did happen, right? And so that was the, the situation that would have resulted in that. Um, if that situation were to happen again, uh, and then, you know, we added one or two more people, 
Um, you would just, I mean, the whole intent is to try to let everyone be mayor for one part of their term. Um, so, I mean, I think, and it says in here, again, that this is just, uh, in, in essence, um, guidance for you. So, you know, if a situation came up that we did not anticipate, you know, I would hope that a future city council would take that into consideration. And we've had lots of people that don't want to be the mayor either. They right. don't want that spotlight, and that's okay. And, and this probably is in here, and maybe we should put in the protocol manual if a meeting goes past 830, we have to have pizza delivered because my brain is stopping. <laughs> but um, I just, so... In the example of somebody in the middle of a term, if you should be able to serve a full term, I guess, a full year. So, like, if you become mayor midway, do you get a chance to? Yes. Okay. Good. Stacy was like mayor for a, a year and probably a few months, you know. Okay. And so, like, she <clears throat> took over, and I guess it was like August or something, and then you. And then serve the full mayor term Got from it. that point. So. Okay. So I mean, that is something that we could probably further clarify in the protocol manual that it's a c complete year, not an incomplete year. But just to, just to be clear, I'm sorry we're talking about this forever, but it's still like the situation, it's still, even though it's a rotation, it's still a suggestion. So maybe it's my turn to be mayor and the four people sitting next to me are like, mm-mm. They could still say no, yeah. and they could still not vote me in. So it's a suggestion. And it's what we've done, but it doesn't have, you know, there's still the, um, you could still not be mayor. Yeah. It's the protocol. That being said, I really am looking forward to everybody having a chance. There's like really, I mean, there's some pretty cool things that mm -hmm. you, the opportunities that come to you. And I would really want everybody to have a chance to be able to experience that. The goods and the bads. So. Okay. And. <laughs> Were we going to further discuss the removal of somebody who is an absolute disaster or what we have already is? Well, I think that what you have already um, is sufficient. Um, we can add some additional language that just, that just further reiterates that um, a, council, a, man, a mayor can be removed at any time by a majority of the council. Um, it's kind of encompassed in that A super majority or a majority? Does it have to be like... I mean, as it stands right now, it would be majority because it, be, it, would, it would go <clears throat> down to this last paragraph that says a majority of the council retains the authority to disregard the process and select any member of the city council for these positions. That would apply to removal as well. We can clarify that that... That that it's, it's the same as with the city manager. The majority of the council can yeah. remove the city manager. Well, and I think, I don't know if this was what you were getting at, Kimberly, but um, in the past, we were wondering, like, does the council have the power to remove a council member? Like, again, we can use me as the example. And what we've learned is no, and it wasn't just that our protocol manual wasn't tough enough. The only way that to get rid of one of us is to not be reelected or for a recall by the public. Or quo rento, which only happens in the beginning. So it's, it's, there's only three, three or or uh, felony conviction. So there's four ways. Hopefully, none of those happen. But we can add language to that effect if we didn't already into the section where we talk about censure. You know, sort of options around that yeah. removal from committees and removal from. So typically, when it happens, positions. just to draw the public's attention to it, it would happen uh, related to the censure provisions. I'm trying to I have it in my notes where those are at, but probably easiest just to. So that's 8.14 under, under decorum. 8.14, 8.14. Fourteen, fourteen. Sorry, bad habit of mine. It's packet page 151. In the final version, we'll have page numbers. Yes. Uh, 
So this just outlines basically um, admonishment, reprimand, and censure, which are the main methods that you have under the law to punish a sitting council member. There is obviously removal from office if it's a non-elected official. But this is where we could add in a section around removal from com other liaison appointments um, and or positions of leadership within the council. Yeah, we can add additional language there if you'd like. Yeah, so we can minimize the person's exposure, but we just can't, they can't take their seat away. What's next? Just thank you, everybody, for your very thoughtful contributions. I'm learning lots. I appreciate it. Really, no. <laughs> Doug might have some more. Yeah. Or, or Karen, do you, either one of you might have other thoughts? I went through all of mine. Yeah. No, I think that we've, we've covered <clears throat> the main ones that I thought needed some additional comment. Um, would you be able to throw those up on the screen again? I tried to make notes on the ones that you highlighted. You said most of them, or did we cover all of them? No, we've covered all of them. The, the, I had um, I wanted to make sure that we went over the um, public official discipline, which was in 8.14, admonishment, reprimand, and censure. So, um, so, so those are, we've talked about a little bit about that, and then we're going to add additional language in there about the, the removal. We'll also add the removal section to the provision that we were looking at before. I um, have, I'm sorry, I have one more quick question. Mm -hmm. There's like a very small piece on resignations. I mean, there have been a lot of resignations in the last couple of years. And um, do we need to clarify like appointment versus waiting until the next election season or is that up to the discretion of the council government things are it's government code does I mean does that need to spell out be spelled out in here um, it is it is spelled out in California government code it is the discretion of the council depending on the time of the resignation of the member you have different options um, I have seen council protocols that do favor one over the other um, ie they favor appointment because I think it's you know kind of quick and can happen um, you know with the lowest cost or they really favor moving to either a special election or they wait till the next general election because uh, they believe that's most democratic. So um, it, there, if this council had a... Yeah, I think it really depends on like the time when it happens. So I think that just leaving it, I just want to make sure that I just got it out there. So, yeah, just so we leaving can, it be like go to government code is fine. We can further clarify that it's, it's discretionary and that we, I, I think, I mean, we regurgitate other areas of, of the government code in here, so maybe that's a, another area that we'll, we'll add just so that this is a more comprehensive document. Are, is everybody okay going to public comment? All right, let's, let's take public comment. Okay, hi, my name is Joanne McGarry, and three things. Um, uh, the land acknowledgement and the uh, Pledge of Allegiance may be switching. The order uh, might be considered. Um, see how that goes, you know, and, and as this protocol manual says, you can make changes as soon as you approve it, so that's that. Uh, secondly, um, staff reports at the beginning of the meeting is really helpful. I think I've mentioned before at this time, when I give second public comment and the staff report hasn't been given yet, I don't have the opportunity to learn from that staff report information that I might want to comment on. So. I think letting the staff give their reports early lets them go home early so that they're bright and fresh um, at work the following day. So I really do think staff reports should be um, made earlier in the agenda. Also, just being flexible in the agenda, there's been times, whether it's the county or the city of Eureka, I've seen where they've moved items 
at the beginning where the mayor will say something like, we have, uh, does anybody um, object to or can we propose that we move such and such an item to earlier? I think we actually even did that with the ceasefire resolution. So, um, you know, flexibility is a good thing. My final thing is about public comment. Um, I really want more people here. I don't want to be standing up here all the time, although I love it in many ways, but uh, I want people's voices to be heard. Like I said earlier tonight, you know, the citizens are an equal part of this thing. Sometimes if I talk twice, I talk twice because people are sharing with me and they're not coming to the meeting and I just want to share with you what I've heard so that, you know, because I feel like I'm a conduit in that regard. So I, I believe that, um, within reason, allowing people like me who come all the time and there's not a huge crowd and I do step aside and let other people speak if, if um, there's a lot of people. So I just think that is um, a good thing to allow people to speak twice. Learning about the flag issue just tonight makes me um, really wanna speak to that issue. I was able to speak to it because I heard about it before I got to speak, but I think there's a value in letting the public speak at the beginning. And if they can go home and eat their dinner, maybe they can't call in if they've already spoken. But if I'm staying around and I'm hearing things, I think there's a um, good um, balance of um, voices to be heard in letting a person speak a second time. So uh, just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to address the standard of best practices and ethics. And basically, I learned about this decades ago as an employee at the University of California, Santa Barbara. But, um, you know, what happens is we, there's a lot of things that pop up that, you know, aren't really on this, you know, and, and I faced it at the university and you faced it here. And I, I want to bring up an example of that. Um, you about, you know, some time ago, you basically got a lot of information from the public saying, hey, we want to speed up the process with the, the general plan and the gateway as far as our um, you know, plan commission. And so immediately after you, you made that, we had a meeting. And, um, and I think Fred remembers this one because we, we were all prepared, the public, there wasn't very many of us. And all of a sudden the rules were changed that we weren't going to be allowed to speak. And that what happened at that meeting also was that we changed it to a special special meetings. And the word special to me means it doesn't happen very often, but then it then it continued week after week, month after month. So the, the public got sh shut out from the normal meetings. We couldn't respond to just like the way that we're doing tonight. So um, to me, that was a definitely an ethic violation. It's like, I, I don't see how we could have continued like that. And um, I was just waiting for somebody like our city manager. I mean, we, we brought this back to you in the beginning and said, this isn't right. And it went on for months and months. And finally, some uh, women, thank God for women, um, called in, you know, in the evening after months and months and said, this is totally illegal, you know, and then after they said that, you know, the, the planning commission quickly went back to regular, regular session, you know. So that's my example of, for my ethics, that was it was <coughs> it crossed the line, and um, you know, that that was on you. So um, I'd also address what this what was brought up tonight about the rotation, and I'll you know, don't take this personally. This is an article in the New York Times, but basically what they said about you know government people that run for office in general that um you know we get some really excellent people and they pointed out that lincoln as an example but also it attracts people with certain personalities kind of narcissistic ones that want you know the power and it's hard to hard to give it up it's kind of like lord of the rings so i would i think it's very helpful to that you actually do rotate and it you know they've done studies in europe on this where actually people that were just not elected were just brought in to run the place and it actually worked out a lot better that way from the standpoint they weren't attracted to power. Thank you. Yes, good evening, Council. Um, I'll, I've sent in my written comments, so I'll be brief. Um, 
a brief on some things. Um, if the goal is to have one document for all officials, it needs substantial editing, in my opinion, but it can be done, and I, I think that's a good consideration. Um, in general, uh, you're a great counsel. You're cohesive, you're nice, you're fair, but in looking at these protocols, think of it also in terms of a council which is more divided, as we've seen in the past. In terms of uh, removing a mayor, I would propose that it be a four-person vote because uh, as council member Stillman and I have both seen and many other people, there's often been a three to two split in the council. So the three people could eliminate the mayorship on the other two. Um, in general, the changes that have been suggested are good to keep things running smoothly, uh, but have the potential of diminishing public input and have a potential of abusing the process. Not this council, but hopefully no council in the future too. So watch out for that. Um, the public can no longer remove items from the consent calendar, but can comment. Uh, generally, the, we haven't been receiving a period for commenting before the vote, so that'll be looked at. Um, the notion that of having people who are here comment in the beginning over people who are at home, I would defer to uh, legal counsel on that. I think that may not be possible because they could be handicapped at home. There could be all kinds of reasons. It's a form of discrimination. Um, the um, uh, one thing that's important, um, the protocol manual and in the presentation stated that the public comments after the council has commented. Often it's, uh, we're asked to comment before the council has discussed things, uh, which I don't like, because we don't know what you're thinking. Okay, um, again, I've got written comments. I can send some more in. On the seating of time, I am not against ending the seating of time. I'm actually surprised that more people haven't abused it. Uh, I would request that the line uh, to uh, members of the public may not see the time for comments the, to prevent unfair domination of meetings by regular commenters, remove that section. Um, I studied this uh, in January. I talked to the city manager about this. Um, the, I, I have a list in the, my written comments. Curiously, the California Fair Practice, Political Practices Commission, allows seating of time, uh, City of Santa Cruz, Berkeley, San Francisco. The uh, one thing that I request the planning commission meetings often had a single agenda item on the menu that covered a variety of things. I think that violated the Brown Act and the public had to had three minutes to comment on things that took two and a half hours to speak. That needs to be corrected. Thank Thanks. you, thank you. Anybody else in person, public comment? Is there anybody on Zoom? Okay. Yep, first online is Lisa. Go ahead, Lisa. Good evening, council members. I want to first ask the council to consider who your Zoom commenters are, may be. Older folks, people with disabilities, people without cars, students who are studying, people with children, caregivers, people who are out of town, and others who simply cannot or do not feel comfortable coming down to City Hall. Additionally, Zoom rules in terms of environmental impact. I am here to comment on the timing of the public comment period for items on the agenda at both the Council and Planning Commission meetings. I believe that the public comment period should be received well before significant commission or council deliberations, perhaps right after or a little bit after questions of staff. As a citizen involved for about 30 years, I have noticed in recent years that public comment for items on the agenda have gravitated habitually towards the end of deliberations. The perception or reality is that minds have already been made up and that decision makers are anxious to move forward with their decision regardless of what comments may be heard at that time from the public. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. All right, it looks like we have uh, one more. Jim, go ahead. Hello to staff and council. Um, I do 
reiterate a lot of Lisa's comments. Are you still there, Jim? I'm sorry, I think we lost you. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, now, can you hear me again? We can. I think I got muted I'll again. start your time I, over. Uh, Go ahead. Appreciate it. Oh, Jim. Jim? I just got, I just got muted again. All right, can you hear me now? We can. All right, can you start over? Because I'm not doing it. <laughs> so, all right, so we'll start again. All right, so I don't believe you should eliminate Zoom from early oral communication. I think if you decide to prioritize in person, that's fine. I just don't think you should eliminate it altogether. And there are a number of reasons. I think both Brad and Lisa brought those up. Um, and I just want to make sure that um, the new policy on early oral communication to just speak once will not be carrying over to business items. I don't believe it should be. We'll still get our time to speak on those. Um, I think it's important and it's it's valuable that for anybody to speak there. If you come just once or you come frequently to meetings, everything is a good con contribution to the process and I hope it'll be looked at in the future that way. Um, I do support council members that are had the majority of uh, continuing with the idea of a, a mayor, vice mayor rotation. Um, it just seemed kind of wrong at this point in the random time to bring up the idea to stop that. I didn't quite understand it, but I, I am glad that most of you feel like it's a valuable process to continue. Um, and I do believe that community members should be able to pull consent calendar items. I don't know if you need to be alerted ahead of time. I realize you probably consider it some slowdown in the process, but there are things on a consent calendar that really deserve attention. And I don't think it's always the decisions made well as far as if something should be discussed further. Um, I think you should have a further conversation about that and really, you know, decide if you just want to eliminate that altogether. To me, it seems once again, it's like you're kind of already making this decision that the people that are speaking and wanting to pull something like that are wasting time, when in fact, it might be an item that really does need further discussion. Um, yeah, well, that's about it. Anyway, thank you. And I do appreciate my opportunities to speak. Thanks, Jim. Anybody else on public comment? Uh, call in user one, go ahead. Hello, um, can you hear me? We can. Oh, okay, uh, this is Lisa. I'm uh, calling to comment uh, on um, early oral communication. I really think that you should be creating opportunities for free speech and to expand public comment, uh, not, be, not be trying to curtail people's ability to, to speak. And I really think uh, that you could expand the public comment for like say 20 minutes and then if you had 10 people showed up who showed up to speak everyone would get two minutes and uh that's only five minutes more and people w could be able to go about their lives go home and have dinner and whatnot um i also think that people at home should be able to comment because of what lisa b said and others um it's discriminatory to, you know, people who are handicapped or people who are just afraid to come to City Hall because of COVID or they have kids at home or, or um, are caretakers, you know, as Lisa said. Um, I also think that I was a little alarmed by, um, by this language about uh, people engaging in disorder, orderly or boisterous conduct, including utterances or uh, snapping fingers even, you know. Um, some of that could be uh, disruptive, but we've had lots of council meetings in the past that were um, a little bit boisterous, but nothing that, you know, that should cause concern. I, we've had Justice for Josiah meetings, um, uh, agenda items, the McKinley statue, the sanctuary measure. We had students show up, and uh, student college students can be pretty boisterous, you know. And uh, but that's part of living in a college town. And so I think there needs to be before you curtail pe people's uh, speech, you know, whether it's holding up a sign. And I agree that lady who held up the sign behind someone who asked her not to do that was uh, disruptive. But we should be able to hold up signs. Uh, seniors have bought, brought balloons to the council meetings. Um, people have snapped. There needs to be a little bit of, um, you know, there needs to be a little bit of tolerance for people being a little bit boisterous and maybe even interacting a little bit with you guys, but not so disruptive that it makes the meeting, you know, 
hard to uh, continue. So I'm a little bit uh, leery of some of this language that's in there. But anyway, I will write you a letter about it, and I, I appreciate your um, your efforts to. Oh, also the uh, seating of uh, the uh, consent calendar. The public should be able to pull items from the consent calendar. If we don't have that ability, then we don't we can't speak out of out about items of concern to us. If one of you haven't pulled an item, thank from you, the Lisa, for your calendar. comments. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else on Zoom? Uh, nope. All right. Now, because of you, I'm going to call this my precious for the rest of my term. Thank you so much. Um, let's, if you don't mind, let us revisit the consent calendar because I think that we've had a lot of comments. I just want to reiterate that if the public can't pull items off the consent calendar, when the public pulls items off the cons consent calendar now, they've got their three minutes to make a comment and we don't really have to respond or have a staff report. So it's really nothing different than if nobody pulls anything off the consent calendar, people can still line up and make public comment on any item. So really nothing changes. Also, I have know in the past I've had people email me concerned about something that was on the consent calendar and ask me to pull it off or have a conversation of it and that I'm absolutely fine to continue to do. I think that, you know, the purpose beyond the consent calendar is things that have already been budgeted for, have things that have already been discussed or one of our goals and so it's just a, it, it doesn't need to be like a huge thing. Um, I would like to, um champion for keeping the ability for the public to pull consent items. I've known sometimes that I was actually enlightened and hadn't thought of, you know, particular things that otherwise I wouldn't have known about. So I wanted to say that. Um, and I want to talk about other things, but I think I want everybody else to have an opportunity to weigh in on the consent calendar. Yeah, but even if they don't pull it off, they can still come up and make public comment about that exact item. And then if you're enlightened. So let's say, so there's an item on the, there's a consent calendar. We, nobody wants to pull anything off. Um, then we open it up to public comment and then somebody can say, I have a comment about item F and then they make this comment and which is what would happen anyway. And then if you were so enlightened by that comment, you could say, you know, thank you. And then you could say, all right, that brought up a good point. Can we get a staff report or can somebody, you know, explain it a little more? So that still is a complete could I ask clarification, would that limit them then on other topics if they chose to use it for the consent calendar? No. Okay, great. Sorry. No, sure. I'm, and and I'm, like structure, right? Like, so like, we'll read the consent calendar, we'll ask for public comment on the consent calendar, then we will ask, does staff or a member of the council would like to pull an item from consent, right? Because if you set it up that way, whether or not you're hollering out E from the audience and we say, okay, let's approve A, B, C, and D. Okay, let's talk about E, where, give me your three minute comment. It, it really isn't different. It's the same amount of time to comment. You're just doing it at a different time and you're not, because it's difficult to, you know, come up, say in the microphone what you want, you want. okay, now sit back down, now come back up again, make your comment. And I'll just add that to, to kind of, echo your point, Meredith, that a very wise county supervisor shared this with me, that like it's the perfect opportunity for us as council members to have that conversation with members of the public. If something is that important to a member of, a pub, of the public that they reach out, reach out to their council members and say, hey, you should pull this from consent, that kind of shows like that two-way commitment from me to my constituent of like, oh yeah, I do think that's an important valid concern. I hear you. I'm going to pull this item from consent so we can talk about it publicly because community members have been concerned about it. So I support not letting members of the public pull consent. And I know I mean, the Board of Supervisors doesn't let members of the public pull consent because it does, I actually think, open that like conversation between council members and, and the public off out, outside of the meeting. And um, as long as we keep that, that structure of, you know, read the consent, call for comment, and then pull items, everybody will still be heard on the items that they wanna hear, and council members can pull items as they wish to. And I feel like maybe I've taken a stupid pill and I apologize. I've done one year. 
um, and so I'm learning, so I'm learning from you. I'm still lost in how they wouldn't lose that opportunity or time because it, it sounds like you're getting yeah. to what sure. I'm getting at. So, so okay. um, let me, let, let's walk through the process. And, and, and I think um, Councilor Schaefer did a good job. The only thing that she left out was if you pull, let's say that you get to the point where you pull, so you called in for the consent calendar, you've taken public comment on the consent calendar, you, you were moved by it or or somebody has requested it and on and then you as a council member at their request decide to remove something they would have had an opportunity to talk on the consent calendar and then once you pull it they would have another opportunity to talk on the item that has then been pulled because the second that you pull it that's they're not limited because they went and talked about the consent calendar generally they now have another opportunity to talk about that particular item because it's been pulled so it's actually more time. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. I'd say the other reason I think this has come forward for a lot of other cities is that um, often people, and we see this, pull an item from the consent calendar because they just want to make a small comment. So in this case, those members of the public could come up and say, I just want to make a comment on item B, and then it's not pulled for a separate vote. It kind of keeps you flowing, but it allows them to make that comment ahead of time. Um, does anybody want to revisit anything else before we move on? Go ahead, Stacey. Yeah, I, well, the, um, there was a few things that I just wanted to address from um, public comment. Um, so one, well, the one I want to circle back to is the idea of should we, I just would like to get your guys' opinions on if we're talking about removing a position, somebody from mayor, should it be 3-2 or, or like a, a what couldn't be 3-2? Should it be a super majority? So I'd like to come back and talk about that. But the other things just to, that came, you know, responses to what I was hearing in public comment, um, we already talked about the consent calendar. Regarding removing people that are boisterous, we have the power to do that right now, yet it's never been done. So I just want to be really clear. We, we can do that. It's not something, when you do that, it tends to cause more of a commotion. So that's why you'll see speakers go over their time sometimes, that you'll see heated things happening. It's the mayor's job to give the warnings, to calm things down. The mayor has the power right then and there to ask the police to remove them, but that we've never done that. So unless it was a really extreme circumstance, we're not going to do that. So I just want to be clear. It's not like we put this in there so that next week, as soon as somebody snaps their finger, we can kick them out. Yeah. That's not the spirit of this. Can I add just one thing to that? Because yeah. I want to make it really clear because I, um, I don't want the public to be confused. The addition just regurgitates, just regurgitates California law. We actually didn't add anything in there that's new that's not just state law. We just put the state law that's in there. Uh, and it's not geared towards people snapping their fingers in the back. It's not even about people having signs. Like we didn't, we didn't change the rules because we had, uh, had a whole bunch of signs. What we did change the rules is to say that the signs have to be in a position that they can't block people from seeing. So you can still have the signs. Right. You just have to be at the back of the room, not in front of people who are trying to see. So I just want to make that. Well, then the last thing, and this might not be popular, but it's just the reality of it is that the, yes, the public needs to be heard and should be heard, absolutely. But that is also our job for phone calls and emails and all that. There are lots of times that I will engage with a member of the public far more than I will get to engage with my colleagues because I will have an hour meeting with somebody over coffee and discuss something. I can do that with one council member, but not all of them. So at some point, we have to have time. It can't just be a meeting that's public comment. We have city business to conduct. We have discussions that we need to have, and we can't have them any other place than here. So it is also our meeting to actually hear from one another and discuss. So time, that is important too. Yes, the public comment is important, but there has to be a balance. So that's what we're always striving to do is create that balance. But I think sometimes people forget that we can't talk to each other. And so this is our time to talk to each other. And that also was very important. I wanted to um, address both of those things. Um, first, the removal of a mayor, I would like to propose a supermajority. And, okay. and then the other one is I would like to recap my um, prioritizing those who are here um, 
the point was well taken. There are people who it's not by choice they're not here. It's because they can't. They don't drive at night. They have children, and they you know we don't have on site child care. Um, so there's so many reasons. Uh, one reason I know that Spanish speaking residents don't come here because they can get at home and have somebody help translate for them, which would be very disruptive here. And unfortunately, we need to figure that out too because we need to have equity. But, but that's why they don't come because they don't understand and so they have somebody at home who can do that translation. And then of course you have the older adult community, um, so many reasons. So yeah, I just want to recant that maybe prioritizing people who can come here is um, not fair and I wanna make sure that we are equitable to everyone. I'm actually fine with that. I think that, you know, I'm just wondering as far as Zoom goes, I know that yes, there are a lot of cities that are now not doing Zoom anymore. Is there any kind of laws or bills that are coming through that are is, have the possibility of ending the Zoom option like altogether? Because I think, I mean, while we have Zoom, I'm totally fine with taking the first five in person and going to Zoom. As long as people aren't speaking at both things, as long as it's a one-shot deal, I'm totally fine with half of it being Zoom. I just want to know that eventually we'll probably have to revisit it because I've heard that coming down the pipelines are bills that are going to end Zoom. So there's no viable bill bills that I'm currently aware of that would be targeted at ending Zoom. Um, I do represent a few of the cities, one in particular who has ended Zoom because they got bombed. Um, so, and in that situation, <clears throat> it was about two or three hours of racial epithets. <clears throat> um, and it was directed at, you know, police officers of color and things of that nature. And it was very personal in, in nature. Um, and there was two or three people that showed up in person, and then there was a bunch on the on the phone. Um, and so um, it has been our policy following that to not recommend Zoom for public comment, to utilize it as a method for people to, uh, to observe, but not as a method for, for communications, uh, at least not without some form of disability or you know some kind of um, request for a special accommodation. Um, so that's, the experience that we had that has jaded and kind of colored our our, um, our experience, and, and and so half of my city has decided that's it um, af after that. Um, so, but um, so th my recommendation is to, is to not have Zoom for public comment, but it comes from that perspective. Yeah, and I think that here in Arcata we are very lucky that most of the people here are very reasonable and have legitimate things to say. So I appreciate that. And, you know, for the 15 minute open time period, I get it. I'm fine to do the first five in person and then go to Zoom. And and as long as it's, you know, that's your one one shot deal. And then, you know, we can revisit Zoom the next time we go through the protocol manual. I'm totally fine with that. And I concur, Arcata is unique, and I feel like if it's not broke, let's not fix it. And my understanding is we will be able to revisit the protocol manual annually. So we can tweak it and make those changes accordingly if that became a thing. I'd like to think it won't become a thing here in Arcata. No, absolutely. So the goal is to come back once a year. And again, I just tell you what my recommendations are and why I have the recommendations. Your your job is to help us keep Arcata Arcata. So, so um so yeah, absolutely, you're 100% correct. Well, and we can bring the protocol manual back at any time. It doesn't have to be in a year. And I would argue it probably wouldn't be folks from Arcata that ruined it from us. I don't, you know, and that's the problem is we can't control those outside forces. You know what I mean? It's not typically in those meetings. It's not, I mean, I don't know. If it was Arcata, I wouldn't think it would be our people doing that. But it could very well be some people from other states who don't like what we're doing or organizations. And that's, that's the problem with our little local meetings being ac accessible to people all over the world and that's where it gets muddy but we haven't had that problem and maybe we should quit talking about it so we don't have it <laughs> uh, uh, now we're gonna have it <laughs> alice do you have one more thing to say and then i think we can move on yeah i just wanted to ask so this it was brought up staff presentation public comment and then the council has just makes comments and decision is that the is that out? 
That was your you brought that's that Rosenberg's up. rules. I mean, it's it's, that's it's how it is. the okay. the guideline, okay. but you don't have to. I'm just are we saying. talking about like the timing of when we take public comment? Mm -hmm. I think that we've done it like a lot of different ways, just depending on kind of the topic and the read of the room. I feel like so okay. traditionally how it works is um, there's an inter there's a staff introduction of the item. The mayor then will bring it back, and, and then council members will ask questions if they have questions, because you can't you don't want to form a decision until you've gone out to public comment. So that's why we keep it at questions. Uh, sometimes they have questions that come afterwards, but um, then it goes out to public comment. You take in public comment, then council comes back and has a discussion okay. that which helps you form your ultimate decision, um, and then you make your decision following that. No, I agree with that, but we had. Anyway, I was just dealing with other thinking what someone maybe. All right, so I think that what is the next step? What do you need from us, city attorney? Right. What do you need from us? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll just capture, I think, the, your thoughts from this evening. We will bring it back uh, to you probably your next meeting for you just to go through one more time to make sure we capture fabulous. everything. That's, that's one of the recommendations. So I'm excited about that case in point uh, staff reports, moving them closer. Poor Chief Poor Bart Chief. Silvers <laughs> has been patiently waiting for us. And so had we, yeah, this is going to be a good thing. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Thank you, Council. Those were some um, hot button items to work through and um, I think that we did a really good job. I'm looking forward to seeing um, what you bring back to us and implementing this protocol manual. So let's go just a little bit longer, Chief. Um, let's do some um, oral written communications. Um, do I need to, we all know that the city appreciates our input, so let's, let's line up. <laughs> Three minutes. I'll be really quick. Um, I've been thinking what I want to say today um, based on a lot of um, recent stuff that's happened in our city and um, decisions made by the council, et cetera. And um, indigenous was a word that I um, was really thinking about a lot today. And um, one of the things um, would be really great in a climate changing and adaptation way is to have indigenous plants instead of lawn on the city hall, uh, front of city hall, native plants. Um, so I think that would be really nice. Um, indigenous people have made a lot of comments recently about um, place and um, technology and things like that. And I think um, we need to honor the indigenous people of this area beyond a land acknowledgement and um, I've always strived to um, promote getting Arcata Plaza as the Arcata Peace Plaza, but somebody spoke earlier about name back and Goudini. Sacramento just gave or sold back some land in downtown Sacramento to the Miwok people. And maybe we need to really start looking at um, land back and name back and starting with the plaza and maybe giving that back to the Wiat people. Um, and from there, we can, um, you know, create a, a community and honor the indigenous who, by the way, value their elders. I'm an elder now, and I'm appreciating and not appreciating sometimes being felt invisible or not respected. And I think the um, indigenous respect for elders is something that we can learn from traditional knowledge and respect for their elders, respect for the elders here in our community. So that's what I want to say. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to bring up the, the sea level rise. It was probably something you talked about last night, but I, I wasn't there the whole, whole time. Um, this is something I've been talking about for quite a while, and specifically the Coastal Commission. And I just want you guys to be aware again that when you approve the phase one of the wastewater treatment plant, there was quite a few uh, uh, rules that the Coastal Commission attached to that requirement that you needed to do. And one of them was, there was a separate letter that was from our uh, city manager asking for the levy improvement, which is building uh, up wider and higher. And they denied that. So. Um, I don't think you, when you even voted, you we were even aware of that. And also, 
phase two was last night was on your agenda. I wasn't around, I didn't stay for that, but phase two is levy and, um, enhancement. So this is another thing that's gonna have to go, I assume in front of the Coastal Commission. And also David gave a presentation on the local coastal element, um, updates to that. He gave a presentation that showed Lower G Street and there was gonna be levy and enhancement there. So those are all like super big issues that, you know, as far as what, I'm not an attorney, but I've read their rulings and it, I don't think it's gonna be very fa favorable from to doing those activities. So um, maybe this is something we need to know, like as far as what the outline for, you know, as far as we have our EIR, you know, that's going to have a final EIR that I think was maybe April, April, May or something like that. So what's the sequence as far as when the Coastal Commission is going to get involved in, in this from the standpoint of uh, does it trigger it because we, we haven't updated our, our coastal elements since 1989? That's one. Or is it because of our general plan um, 2045 and we're increasing in the coastal zone um, development that's going to go to seven stories? Is it two times we're going to the Coastal Commission? So I'm not clear myself. I'm just trying to learn this process. My, and I don't think you guys know either. So it should really be spelled out exactly all these steps that are, are we're, we're taking and when possibly these votes are going to happen. You also had a grant for that was a requirement for, uh, for the, by the Coastal Commission as far as sea level rise on where that plant might have to be relocated in the future and all the adaptation. And I think that report is way out in the future there, but it would be nice to get an update exactly when all of this is coming and when, when, when we're gonna find out about these things and just be much more knowledgeable. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, good evening, council members. Uh, I won't speak on anything that was on the agenda specifically. Uh, I want to thank you for your careful and thoughtful consideration of everything that you said tonight. Um, the, uh, I will mention uh, on Arcata1.com, there's an April Fool's issue, four or five articles, plus the April Fool's articles from last year. Uh, there's an article um, about a couple in the early, early 70s who won in Oakland who wanted to downsize from a large house. They like to move to a uh, nice condominium, but they don't exist. There's an article about, about that, which um, just the way we've talked about here in Arcata, people want to downsize, but it's based on what the builders, developers actually build. Um, to repeat what I said earlier, the I believe the results of the FM3 survey should have been presented at a regular meeting. Um, because there's a lot of information there that I think the public would have liked to hear talk about. Um, that's it in general. Uh, I don't know how I appear to you, but I do appreciate the work that you're doing. And I agree with you more than I disagree. I'm not sure how, how it comes off, but I do. Thanks very much. Thanks, Fred. And I do believe you can watch that FM3 presentation on yeah, I Sorry, just was you... noting that that I would report that out too. So we recorded that portion of the meeting, and that will be was up, will be uploaded to our YouTube site. Awesome. Do we have anybody online? We have one. Call in user two. Go ahead. Good evening. Yep. Go ahead. This is John Emig calling from Valley West. Um, happy to be with you all this evening. Uh, two people previously in public comment have mentioned, uh, one was the engineer who'd come here for additional schooling and she said her home was near the freeway. And uh, another gentleman who comments very often uh, brought up in both cases, vehicle noise and as a, an eco groovy sort of community, I think that we need to be reminded that noise pollution is pollution. And I would hope the council would make it a priority to see that any noise and ordinances that we have are enforced and perhaps make even stricter noise ordinances. And that would be a, a police issue. 
And uh, that brings me to the second item that the, the woman, the business owner from the plaza, uh, very eloquently uh, spoke about the gatherings in the plaza that inhibited uh, usual people, the public, from going about their business there. And, and uh, we, I agree with everything she said. I, too, am a, com a compassionate person. I love the idea of having fun. But it seems like it gets out of hand, in my opinion. And it, the same thing happens in Valley West up here at the shopping center. So everything that she said about the, the plaza goes for Valley West at the shopping center as well. And along with maybe additional police patrols that would quell that sort of activity, uh, Courtyard's Apartments is high density with elderly people and uh, young families with children. Um, we could use a patrol during the day, once a day, and, and one once in the evening. And I think that would go a long way to helping the residents here feel safe. Um, an agenda item that I would like to see relevant to, to that is you know, what percentage of the revenue for Ar Arcata comes from the Valley West area, including the industrial properties. And, and maybe there would be more of a balance of how much police presence there is and, and other kinds of investments here for public safety. And so I'd like to see that on, on the agenda to, to ask staff to give us a specific number of what percentage of the revenue comes from this area. And then another agenda item I would request is that uh, you could discuss what the obstacles are for having a public safety committee. Uh, I understand that it's understaffed and you need to promote it somehow, but that liaison between the public and the police, I, I think, uh, would go a long way toward perhaps helping address these situations of, of police Thank you, patrol. John. That's your time. And Thank you so much for your comments. Thank you. All right, we have one more, Jim. Go ahead, Jim. Hello, can you hear me? We can. All right, so I'm gonna to try to get through this without getting needed. It's pretty quick. I was just wondering in the light of the video for the uh, portion on the survey, if, you know, I know in some meetings that they don't video, there's an audio available and just wonder if there's any chance there's an audio for the entire goals meeting. I'd love to hear it. If it's available, you know, if you could possibly attach that you know, to those with that meeting, I think that would be helpful. Um, since it, it wasn't available as far as uh, uh, you know, online and stuff. Now, that's my request, and I don't know if it's possible, but thanks and have a good night. Thanks, Jim. Uh, yes, there is an audio recording, and yes, it will be attached to the meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Oops, I'm already off. <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody else. Chief. <laughs> You're up. All right. And so we have our new Chief Silvers, and we are going to receive an activity report for the first quarter of 2024. Thank you so much. And there are copies on that back chair if there was anyone that didn't receive a copy of the quarterly report. Good evening. Thank you. Um, can you hear me all right? For, excuse me, I'm battling a cold, so I'll try to... <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, that might be a good idea. I, I, would, I don't blame you at all. Um, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and talk about the first quarter of 2024. It's been a busy one for the police department, uh, both inside and out. Um, we'd like to hit on a few things that are going on or have, have transpired over this first three months uh, inside. We've uh, started to institute the first ever wellness program for our, our um, employees. Um, you know, it's very important to me and to the city um, that we provide something that allows our employees to express themselves. Um, they unfortunately deal with a lot of stuff that can cause a lot of stress and stress can cause a lot of uh, emotional and physical ailments. Um, and so I'm really excited about the opportunity for this to come in. Um, and we actually start, we've already started, uh, we're part of a peer support, a regional peer support group um, and so our folks have been able to start that uh, training a couple of weeks ago. Next week, uh, they will be in-house for us to be able to spend a little time with um, and get to know their um, counseling people. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Um, the other thing we've done is we've made three promotions. 
uh, with me um, allowed to take this position. Uh, we've been able to promote a lieutenant um, and a sergeant, and then also kind of a lateral move for a patrol sergeant to move into the detective sergeant position. So that's been real exciting for, for our uh, people to be able to have a little movement uh, and get some people to learn some new um, job skills and to be able to show their leadership and their ability. I thought I saw the gonna, light you're on. Gonna, <laughs> you're gonna share who our promotions were? Sure, Chris Ortega <laughs> um, promoted to, excuse me. <coughs> Chris Ortega promoted to Lieutenant um, and then Victoria Johnson, who was a detective, promoted to sergeant. The lateral move is uh, patrol sergeant Keith Altizer moved to the detective sergeant position. And so they've just been in there. Um, Victoria and Keith have just been in a couple, well, Victoria a couple of days and, and Keith about a week and a half. So we're just getting started. Um, we were able to hire two additional, I shouldn't say additional, two, two more community ambassadors to fill um, the full staff of seven during this quarter. Um, and then as we move into these um, new positions with everybody, our overall staffing is also continuing to improve. Uh, I think I spoke to you in December and at that time we had just graduated three trainees from the academy. Uh, they are well into their training program. Um, they should be out in probably the next um, three to four weeks, um, which will be a great help to us. Um, and we also have a um, dispatcher who is about 12 weeks into her training program as well. And so those will all uh, be great additions to our team. Um, with all of them coming out, uh, specifically the officers, that will allow us in the coming months to be able to fill out our detective bureau again, um, and then also add two additional officers to the community outreach team. So historically, or since that team uh, was formed, it has solely been one sergeant. Um, that's uh, Lou Scown. Uh, so the outreach team will benefit greatly from having two uh, additional team members. They'll be able to address uh, many things for us. Um, I have heard, um, we spoke last night a little bit at the, the goal setting about the plaza. I did hear the business owner today. Um, you know, we will most definitely do what we can in the meantime, um, but as these officers come out, it allows us to, to you know, do a little more directed patrol in areas, uh, the Plaza Valley West. Um, so it will uh, greatly enhance our ability. Um, I guess I'm kind of cheating down here a little bit at the staffing. Um, we're currently, a, you know, two positions down, uh, but we have, in our staffing numbers right now, we, we have one, uh, one is a uh, academy attending the academy and then we still do have those three so we're operating a little lower than our, I guess our numbers show right now uh, but that will improve as, as people either come out of the academy or come out of the training program and then um, if you kind of want to go into the statistics of this um, we had a little over 8900 incidents this quarter that's trending a little higher than last year <laughs> Excuse me. we had about 33,000 for the year last year just to give you a perspective of where we're at I would assume that that's probably going to continue to rise as we get more police officers on the street um, because those incidents are not just uh, calls for service, but they're also officer initiated. Um, and then going down a little bit, uh, we had uh, 330 total arrests for the quarter. Uh, we took uh, 666 reports. And then um, the top five response locations, um, typically the first three are pretty consistent for us. Um, and then the uh, bottom two, which the bottom two um, kind of come and go, if you will. <laughs> um, but consistently, that, that five are, are around for us. Um, I kind of touched on staffing. Um, and then if we kind of move over to the other side of the page, it's kind of our, our alternative response, I guess we would call it, a section of our department. Um, the community ambassadors, um, they've had 511 business interactions, and within that group of uh, interactions, they, they call it um, a contact, a conversation, um, and so they break them out a little bit uh, for them, but I went ahead and combined them for any interaction they had with the business. Um, and then also with the unhoused contacts, they break them out a little more defined, but um, I, I 
put them together there. And then I guess what's a little, uh, kind of took me back was 869. They judge them by buckets. They have five gallon buckets that they walk around with. And so for this three month period, 869 buckets of, of trash that they've removed from the city, um, which is tremendous. I mean, you know, I see them constantly as I'm going around town um, and they're consistent um, and they, they make a tremendous impact. Um, juvenile diversion uh, currently has about 33 open cases. Um, you know, they, they're steady. They, they do a lot um, to help our, the, the youth in our community. Uh, they're in the schools. They continue to do a great job. Um, the 36 people who signed up for, in this case, it was uh, the Loving Solutions um, part of Parent Project, if you will. I was told that that's the most I've ever had um, sign up. Um, so they're, they're still going forward. And then the MIST this quarter was uh, 49 persons um, served, and then 25 of those were newly receiving services. Um, and then uh, parking citations, there was 1,485. Um, and then I just threw in a couple of, of here at the bottom. Um, they've made 774 traffic stops during this three months period, and then uh, 45 um, DUI arrests. So, We've been busy. Um, we're looking forward to getting um, our staffing back up so that we can build out from there. Um, and uh, I just, I guess to comment on one of the last commenters, uh, uh, John was one of the folks that I met when we went on our, our walk in Valley West and he had mentioned uh, the courtyard circle patrols. Um, well, not every day I've made it uh, myself. I've tried to go through there a couple of times. Um, so, you know, I understand we are hearing some of the issues and, and uh, we are and will continue to try and address them the best that we can. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to open it up for council. I just, you know, and I know Kimberly is going to probably bring it up, so I'm going to steal her thunder a little, but it seems like the, the top response locations are very concentrated in, in Valley West, which I'll, I'll let you go from there. So, yeah, I guess I wanted to say that I will ask that the 500 Valley West is at the shopping center, then the 4701 is the Grove, the Home Key Project, and the 4975 would be the West Village Studios. So the shopping center and the two Home Key is the, where we're having all the action, if you will? In Valley West, right. Okay. And then and the, other, the other here is uh, like Safeway or that shopping center here. Right. And then uh, the uh, hospital. Okay. Could I ask another yeah, question? Sure. Okay. So um, I had a couple questions. Um, I'm super grateful for the diversion program and the parent project. I was a recipient. I took that when I had my teenager, I think in seventh grade, um, when we left a charter school, went to Arcata High, it was like, boom. <laughs> so it was a great program. Do you know if you'll be able to offer that in bilingual, both that and the loving solutions in the future ongoing? You know, I don't know at that at this point. Um, I can surely check and, and get back to you. Okay. And then the other program is um, I love what Miss does. I'm wondering. My concern is about adolescent youth right now, and I could be wrong. Correct me. That the only response that you can have for an adolescent youth um, who's having issues, whether it be mental health or behavioral, is to call law enforcement. And and I'm a little reticent to have that. I want our youth to have a different relationship with our law enforcement. And so we don't really have anything in between that's comparable to MIST for adolescent youth. Is that correct? Depending on what it is, we may call uh, juvenile diversion. Um, and I think that we, we could call MIST out to the scene, if you will, um, to assist us. Uh, and maybe and maybe make a contact for us and give us some advice as to who may provide those services. So what I'm hearing from people in the community is that um, MIST has not been dispatched for youth in a particular um, instances, um, that that's never been. It's always been law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if we might kind of think out of the box, somehow brainstorm something that can address adolescent youth. I know when we looked at the FM3 survey, 
um, they parsed it out in two separate ones. One was about juvenile diversion, the other was about activities. And of course, you know, idle minds, idle hands get in trouble. So that could be part of the solution is that we have more youth activities, but also, you know, just like everyone, um, mental health issues, not being, uh, the, 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 the county's not responsive. And I know that that's on them, and but but then it's our Arcata adolescent youth that suffers when they don't respond after five or on the weekend. And we can't time these emergencies, unfortunately. So if there was something that we could somehow fill in that gap uh, for Arcata for our adolescent youth, that would be really helpful. Yeah, I agree. I don't know that, I think that's a bigger project, if you will, or not. I don't know that that's something that specifically the police department would be able to come up with given the examples like you're saying if it's a Friday night or a Saturday and then you know a, a juvenile is having a, a mental health issue or something like that um, you know I think that may be a bigger issue than what we would do or be able to do certainly right now at, at this but time. that's what MIST does right they come for it's a mobile intervention crisis whether it be behavioral or a mental health issue it's a de-escalation and we don't have that equivalent it's my understanding for Adolescent, we have to call the law enforcement. Right, the way MIST works for us through our department is they come and they work for us two days a week, um, and then we get a call, an officer goes out, and it's clear that someone is dealing with a mental health crisis or a mental health issue, rather than um, having us deal with it. Um, rightfully so, we call MIST, they come out, they have the expertise, the training, the press, and then also the context to help, contacts to help these people um, get through it or to put them in touch with people that can do that. Um, so it's not um, per se that you can call at two o'clock in the morning and a group will come out. Now I do know that going forward, there are, there are going to be some changes uh, kind of with some mandates of 24 hour services. That's through the county as well. Um, and that is not even begun, but that is on the horizon and that's something that's coming in the future. So Kimberly, I was thinking, so I always understood that the police are called first and then they call MIST. It's not like they call MIST first. Mm -hmm, that's correct. Right. Okay. Um, I just want to say that just these numbers of the top response locations, I, I do think that when staffing allows, having a hub in Valley West is is problem is really important. I mean, I work out there too. I Sometimes when I'm alone in my office, I lock the door. Um, but it, it just seems like that is a, a worthwhile use of resources to have people staffed out there more when that becomes a possibility. So that's one thing. And then, can you address noise and what, <laughs> and, and <laughs> let's just talk, let's just talk about it. Let's just talk about noise. Uh, noise in general? I mean, I don't know. Well, it's noisy cars. I mean, noisy honestly, cars. we have, I have one car because I, you know, I work on Hinden and there is a truck that drives by two times a day. It sets off car alarm. I mean, it's not really my wheelhouse. I don't know, like, but the, the I do know that there are give you noise is ordinances and what is your policy on enforcing it, if, if any? Two different things. Uh, the, the car you're describing, that's a vehicle code. Um, we did have a noise ordinance with the city. Um, and then, you know, so many decibels. Um, my experience, as long as I've been here, I don't know that that has ever been um, enforced as far as brought to a, it, it's been enforced in the sense that you would go to a party, you would go to a concert or something and say, hey, you're over the, you know, you need to shut it down. Um, but as far as taking administrative action or anything through the city, I, I'm not aware of that. Um, it could have happened, but I'm not aware. And then the vehicle code part of it, the best I can tell or ask you is to call us when it's happening. Um, it's tough. I mean, it's because obviously they're moving vehicles. They're, they're moving, um, right. It, no, it, 
And I know, like, I've done it drive-alongs um, with Sergeant Scallon, and, uh, you know, I remember, like, driving past Blondie's, and he's like, oh, that one, we're there all the time. We shut them down for noise. So I know that, you know, it's something that people are aware of. I just wanted to make sure that we're having a little bit of this conversation. And, and I will say that in most of the time when we deal with a party or, or whatever is the source of the noise, we can typically get compliance. Um, there, in the case of a party, there are uh, avenues of, you know, they issue a warning uh, when, we, when we go. Um, if they don't uh, either shut it down, reduce the noise, um, you know, get the crowd inside your house, or um, there is uh, the ability to cite them, um, and they're charged a per minute rate per officer while that, until it is corrected. And then I just want to once again echo the conversation that we had last night and address um, Natalie's, you know, public comment that um, just working up to have that presence on the plaza and just making things uncomfortable for people that are breaking the law and just holding people accountable to the same standards that the business owners are as far as like loitering or smoking or drinking or dog dogs I I, just a you know just a conversation to to keep having because I know that it's not something that is gonna like solve itself but um, it's it's a conversation that we we should continue to have I'm done. thank you for bringing that up um, with regards to getting oh I'm sorry I'll be quick okay so thank you for bringing that up for Valley West and it sounds like we will have a building anyway that they can occupy so that's great it may not be for open for public but it is a place for you to be you don't have to drive back to city hall to use the restroom etc um, and i think just having the cars in the parking lot having that visual presence might be helpful um i'm wondering about the vehicle code and enforcement like making people uncomfortable i think it's just like a half dozen maybe not even that are like i think I don't, I don't want to make a blanket statement. So young people, louder the better. It's like cool to have this really obnoxious, loud engine that literally if it makes me jump out of my skin when it comes up. It's like, whoa. Um, and then, you know, also car enthusiasts. But, but I think it's just a few. So if you give them a ticket, they're going to tell their friends and pretty soon they're going to take that modified whatever it is that makes all this noise that shouldn't have even passed DMV or whoever does that stuff. But it's out now and, and we need to enforce that. And I think that it'll make everyone happier. Um, I hear them up and down on the freeway because I live out there. Um, and I couldn't imagine what it would be like in a tiny little cul-de-sac where everything's all quiet. All of a sudden, here comes the big loud engine making this yeah that's what i'm wondering okay ladies do you have anything to add i just wanted to say thank you for the i appreciate the statistics that's nice to have and i know the public appreciates that and um thanks for the great job that you're doing in your role i'm sure there's a lot of adjusting to a new position um and yeah we're just glad to have so many um, new people um, with us and the enthusiasm that I've seen when I've been out talking with the newer people on our staff is really great. So we're, I'm appreciative of that. Well, just thank you. And again, I like numbers and it's great to see this and just hopefully uh, next time you're here before us, you won't have to stay till almost 9 30, 10 o'clock. So just thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And you know, I appreciate you know every time reading feedback about the officers that go out of their way to be extraordinary. And um, I think that um, I'm really proud of Arcata Police. And um, and thank you, Alex. One more thing. Yeah, I wanted to uh, address. You know, um, she brought up the two locations that are both um, home key projects. So, do we have any kind of um, meetings there working with people i mean you have so many call well they aren't so actually that many 154 or maybe it's a lot i have no idea in comparison to other things but i'm wondering what is going on there that could be actually dispelled or how it be able to handle those two groups of um, places i know uh, f street's a different story down there but if there is some way that there could be some kind of meetings or 
whatever they're doing to talk about trying to eliminate this many calls. Well, I think it's important to, um, I cut you off, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I think it's important to note that uh, while these addresses may be, or the incident may be uh, related to these addresses, um, I, I, it's not always the people who are living there. Right. You know, it's the, it's the, the address of where it occurred. Um, you know, it might be somebody in the parking lot that somebody calls about or something happens. Mm -hmm. um, so, and there is a lot of foot traffic, you know, so it can be, um, I, while there are a lot of uh, calls up there, you know, it can be a little bit um, confusing is, you know, that, that some of this stuff might be just coincidence that it's in that area. I guess it's the way Kimberly brought it up specifically for addresses. But you know, I have one other thing, and of course I talk about this a lot, and that is cars that only have one headlight. I'm sorry, it's real. But you know, it all started when I had a ride along a long time ago with a policeman. And he said, that's what we do, is we find people, we see them, and then there's other things going on. They could be drunk, or they could have drugs, or they could, it's just a good thing, you know, to, so I bring it up, and here you are. You came specifically to hear that from me again. <laughs> and I do understand about the headlights, I do understand about the, the taillights, and I do agree that, you know, if you correct the behavior through enforcement sometimes, that works, you know, it takes, I guess, being in the right area to, to stop yeah. those vehicles. Many times yeah. people it, will call and say there was a loud car, and of course, like I said earlier, that's a moving vehicle. Well, you vehicle, just see so. them when you're out driving, or I see a sure. lot of them. And you know, one time I said to this couple that were in their car, she had her window down, and I go, oh, you know, have your head light out. And she says, you haven't fixed that yet? <laughs> so, you know, anyway. So it, it's actually not 154, what you were mentioning. It's the total of those three addresses, or 336. And I would be curious what those numbers were two years ago. I think that we will see a huge increase in incidents. And I think that that speaks to what on-site services are being addressed. Um, like you said, a lot of times it's people who are associated with the people that live there, but not necessarily the people that are there. Um, you know, the guests and things. So, so maybe there can be a conversation with both of the home key projects um, to ask them to be good neighbors and to, to vet the people that come in here. You know, it's supposed to be a gated community, but it really isn't. Um, yeah, in, in the 20 years that I've been out there, and I don't, I don't want to be a naysayer, I'm just going to say it has never been this bad crime-wise. Uh, stabbings, uh, you know, we just had one out at Valley West uh, McDonald's. Um, two unhoused individuals got into an altercation and one was stabbed and taken away in an ambulance. And then a couple days later, a shopper was uh, assaulted by two unhoused people. And, and it's like four out of seven days, maybe I'm wrong, it just, feels like it's almost a daily uh, incidence. Um, I will not walk anymore in Valley West. I get into my car and I drive over to the marsh. And I'm just being honest, I know that nobody wants to hear that, but, but that's the reality and we need to address it before it gets rooted and it becomes even worse. Um, because it's not safe. It's not safe for my daughter. It's not safe for some of the elderly. John A. Mig called in and he doesn't feel safe necessarily out there to walk. He has to get in his car also to drive somewhere else. And I feel like that, you know, the neighbors, the, the neighborhood do deserve to live peacefully in their community and to feel safe. And at the same time, these folks that are unhoused deserve to have, and, and it's not your job, of course, but, but housing. You know, how, desperate people do desperate things. And so we need to look at the big picture if we want to start um, addressing these issues. So I'll just add, I think the, the right venue for the conversations and part of, I think, the chief putting these statistics together is to be able to start to have that comparative data as we move forward. Um, but is the Homeless Services Working Group, we are working on getting a representative either from, you know, the Danco operation or RCAA that would be attending those meetings so we can bring these statistics up in that setting. 
Um, I would also offer that in opening a lot of um, housing projects over the years of being here, there is always a break-in period. We saw it with, um, well, I won't list them all, but we've seen that with all, literally, whether it's, it's dedicated low income or whether it's just larger housing complexes, we do see a break-in period that usually is about two years. I do expect these numbers to go down, as we have seen with other projects over time, but I think tracking it will be important and working with them to ensure it happens. All right, well, thank you so much. We'll let you go and get some rest and take care of yourself. But thank you so much. If you guys haven't done a ride along lately, I would suggest that you make an appointment to do one. Thank, thank you. you so much. I enjoyed our walk again. That was great, thank you. All right, are there any other staff updates? Uh, just quickly, a, a couple of things. Construction season is in full swing, so you will see, especially around Old Arcata Road, there will be a lot of both congestion and controlled traffic, so if you can stay out of that area, please do. Uh, we've got one more meeting, I'll report it again, but the farmer's market, uh, we are looking at full plaza closures for the farmer's market this year. It's been a long time safety improvement in that downtown area that this community has been working on. Um, so those will start at the April 20th market. Yay. Um, okay, let's do um, council reports. Kimberly, you wanna start? Whoops, I went to an Arcata House, uh, excuse me, Arcata High School, it's getting late. Sports fundraiser dinner at the Arcata Community Center and um, just wanna remind people, there is a Valley West uh, community cleanup on Sunday, come one, come all. It's on Howland Drive, nine to 11. Hope to see you there. Okay, so um, we, had H we had Humboldt Transit Authority meeting this morning and our um, city engineer came and talked about reconnecting Arcata and he was interested in having HTA, um, Humboldt Transit Authority staff, et cetera, being able to help. And so that was a request that was basically made. And on our next agenda, which will be in May, we'll have a, a resolution or a, in order to uh, support that effort so that we can have that happening. And um, one thing I forgot for the goals, oh, the sidewalk cleaner. The machine that can clean the sidewalks and that's something I've talked about off and on for a long time and it can be in Arcata downtown it can be in Valley West it can go it can move around and uh, maybe some of the shopping centers would actually want to contract with us to do it and I think it would be valuable and I don't know how I forgot it but I had all the information about where you could buy one I don't know if you'll allow being allow me um, to add that to the goals or not. I'm sure we can talk about it when it comes. It's, we're going to talk about budget soon, so I'm sure we can. That would be an appropriate place to talk about it. Thank you. Yeah. Are you okay? That's it. All right. Yes, there is. There will be one more meeting before the plaza is closed to traffic. Um, it's you know in conjunction with Earth Day. I know Zero Waste will be having an event at the um, co-op, so I just encourage everybody to. Um, I and I know that the North Coast Growers Association has been working very diligently to make sure there is plenty of ADA parking and that they have a plan in place. And so if you are unable to. If you need to park, you should be able to. And, and just remember, you know, this is going to be the first day. There will be kinks to work out. I don't think anything's going to be like perfect the first day, but I think the Growers Association and the city appreciates constructive feedback, and we are just trying to do this to be good stewards of the earth. Um, okay, so gosh, was it last week? I don't know. I was um, in Burbank for Amon um, Cal City's. Um, League of California Cities Policy Committee. I'm on the Housing, Community, and Economic Development Committee, and so we got a very high-level briefing of all of the um, housing priority bills that are coming through the pipeline that are about to go into legislation. Really, really interesting stuff. I don't want to talk about a great length about them right now, but um, but you know, lots of discussions about local control versus state control, and it's just really interesting to hear um, other perspectives from other cities. And um, yeah, I think that's it for me. So at um, HCOG meeting last month, I think the highlight for me was Supervisor Arroyo discussed the results of her master's thesis um, that she just recently completed, which is the perceptions of trail safety in Humboldt County. 
um, an, uh, an analysis of safety concerns, factors that impact trail use, and the value people place on trails. And it was really interesting to hear um, sometimes what people's perceptions are, aren't really necessarily statistically what's, what's going on when it comes to safety and that, but she did a great um, discussion of that. So, um, and then I think that's the only um, outside uh, assignment meeting that I had, but I did just want to take a really quick second to address some of the um, the things that were brought up regarding the earth flag and the ruling that um, Dave Meserve just informed us about that. Um, and so uh, I just want people to know that in addition to serving our public, which is our job, it is also our sworn duty to uphold the laws. And it's not that we can uphold the laws we think make sense. So I think the real, the, you know, the, for those people that are passionate about this, it's more like addressing what those laws are. We are mere council people. It is our job to uphold those laws. And I think that we did, I feel like we really did a great balance um, when that passed. We, we knew that it, if it passed, it, um, there was a question, you know, by our legal team as if that, you know, if it was, uh, meeting the law, but we flew it anyways, right? So we, we heard the people, we flew it, and we did our due diligence by going to court. The, the name that was chosen to represent us was not something that was chosen. It's, it, it's in the world of the courts and legal stuff, which is sometimes, no offense, but a little bit of a different world. So what it means to us is not necessarily what it means to them. So case name aside, you know, I, I think that we did what we were what we were elected to do. And we will just keep, you know, moving forward with that as things turn out. But I just wanted to offer kind of clarification on what we are able to do and, and not to do. Thank you, Stacey. Um, all right, Rebel Coast Energy Authority. We had a really amazing grant that we applied for and hopefully we'll hear great things about um and our cea was the lead agency in partnership with the yurok tribe hoopa tribe karuk tribe blue lake rancheria and then technical assistance from shots energy and pg and e um, for this grip grant which is the grid resilience innovation partnership and it's actually a federal grant through the u.s department of energy but basically what it would do is give a insane amount of money it was like i think we're looking at like nine 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 digits here from like 136 million um but to build microgrids for all of the individual tribes to be able to create and own their own microgrids especially like for where there's super bad grid reliability like way out meredith and i were talking about this earlier because she's lived out there out orly and soames bar out crook reservation like it's crazy um how they're in like i think the top 10 of the the most power outages of anywhere in california um so it's a super exciting grant opportunity it's just the first step in a really long line of you know a lot of applications and steps and getting money together but it's a really cool opportunity and it really brings to light see sorry i'm i'm going last i'm gonna be long-winded but you know something that we talked about last night and just something that i really took away from when i went to civic well which is like in these small rural areas like to bring together all of the different partners and to be able to work together to actually get something done because probably if the Kruk tribe applied for a huge grant they wouldn't have the capacity to be able to build a microgrid but if they can work with all these other tribes and pg and and us and it's like oh it can happen and so i think you know to take those lessons and put it in our own communities here too um is awesome also rcea the e-bike rebates are out and have started so if you're trying to double down on those california state rebates and the rcea rebates now is your time um we had an equity arcada board meeting we are continuing to develop that board i did have the opportunity on saturday to go volunteer at the sanctuary garden they're there every saturday from 10 to 12 and they unveiled the new signage um, that the city helped partner with them to put up just about um what a sanctuary garden is what being a sanctuary space means and kind of also like the reporting of any vandalism or hate crimes having to do with that and so they had a really nice celebration um did some weeding and had delicious atole so it was great and then some updates for the chamber uh the chamber mixer is tomorrow thursday at the campus bookstore right across from us here from 5 30 to 7 and then also on friday um they're hosting the 
quarterly chamber young young professionals mixers, um, which is going to be from six to eight at the Plaza Grill view room, and they're doing free um, headshots. So if you are a young professional and you need a really nice picture taken of you, uh, come on down. And then also Friday, April 12th is going to be the April Arts Arcata, and it's going to be a big one, four to eight, and it's also Cal Poly Spring Preview Week. Um, so there's going to be a lot of stores open late. There's going to be a DJ in the middle of the plaza. I know I'm going to be probably helping with some tabling that Equity Arcata is doing, and so there'll be local nonprofits out. And it's going to be a great fun time to just, like, celebrate spring and all the great things the chamber's doing, so, and, and some nice weather. Um, so with that, that's my update. Congratulations on uh, what's going on with the tribes. And yeah, that's amazing. Really, that's fantastic. As someone that has lived on tribal land, I can attest that my power went out for nine days in a row once, and I think that people are going to be very pleased for that. All right, let's set a date for study sessions with um, City Committee Commission Chairpersons. We will keep doodle polling you on that one, and we will hopefully have some answers by your next meeting. All right, and then um, budget study session, my favorite. You're just Ladies confirming to... April 16th. April 16th? 530. I think I have that on my, is it Will there? we be able to have that available via Zoom, or will it be like the last one? Um, I mean, I think that's a discussion certainly that the council can have. Um, you know, we've, we've taken criticism doing them both ways. Uh, you know, if you, it is easier for us to do Zoom if you are up on the dais. The conversation that you can have around the table, you know, can lend to better conversation of the council, uh, but it does make it more awkward to do the Zoom kind of hybrid option. They sat in that circle, and then they all could see each other, and they could all talk to each other. But we didn't have Zoom then. So I don't know how you do Zoom under that, but it seemed to work really well because you were able to have everyone sort of in a group. And the council was totally mixed into that group. Okay, I don't think that this is a time that we should discuss this. But, um, you brought it up, so. Yeah. All right. My precious says Use this meeting is adjourned.